Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. You know me as host of the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, but when I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a book about my experience called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. Now, if you own or operate a business, ask yourself the following marketing-related questions and be honest with your answers. Are you generating fresh new qualified leads on a daily basis? Is your website generating enough sales? And if not, do you know why? Is your advertising effective? Is it predictably and reliably making you several multiples of what you're spending on it? And lastly, are you consistently communicating with your email list? Or do you have an email list of prospects and customers, but you have no idea what to say to them, how often to say it, or how to make money with this list? If you need solutions for these marketing problems, then you need to book a one-on-one marketing strategy session with me. After this strategy session, you'll know how to speak to and make money with your email list, how to use your website to attract customers and clients who are ready to buy from you now, and how to sell your goods and services for top dollar and at much higher profit margins than your competition. Listen, stop hoping things will get better on their own. Hope is not a very good business strategy. Instead, book a marketing strategy session with me by going to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing and find out if your business meets the five criteria you need to qualify for this service. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. If you play acoustic guitar There's two things that are going to happen when you go check out today's guest, Pat Flynn, online, if you haven't heard him already. Uh, You're going to either listen to him play and say, wow, that's the most inspirational thing I've ever seen. I've never heard or seen anybody play acoustic guitar that well. Or you're going to say, I need to take up a new hobby like underwater basket weaving or something like that. But either way, you're in for a treat. We're here today with Pat Flynn. He's literally the best acoustic guitar player I've ever seen, that's for sure. For 10 years, he played with Bela Fleck, Sam Bush, and John Cowan as a member of the highly influential group New Grass Revival. During his tenure with New Grass Revival, Fretz Magazine's National Reader's Poll voted Pat best acoustic guitarist for five consecutive years. That's like you know winning the Mr. Olympia five consecutive years. And for winning five years in a row, he was inducted into the Fretz Gallery of Greats alongside, check these names out, Chet Atkins, Doc Watson, and Tony Rice. Pat's also a first-call session guitarist in Nashville, and he's played on more than 400 albums, including 32 gold and platinum records, as well as CMA and Grammy Award-winning projects with top artists, including Bela Fleck, the Bellamy Brothers, Garth Brooks, Glenn Campbell, Leanne Womack, Roseanne Cash, Reba McIntyre, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, George Strait, and Randy Travis, amongst tons of others. He also wrote and performed on Garth Brooks' hit single, Do What You Gotta Do. He's also a producer and a songwriter who co-wrote and produced Michael Martin Murphy's Long Away to Return to Form album called Red River Drifter. That was Murphy's best-selling, best-selling and best-reviewed album in over 20 years. He also managed to, time, to find time to tour as an electric lead guitarist with musical icon and personal hero Leon Russell. His newest CD, Renew, has just been released and it's now available from all available outlets including iTunes, CD Baby, Amazon, and all the usual suspects, or you could get that and all his other releases at Pat Flynn Music. That's F-L-Y-N-N music.com. Pat, thanks so much for your time, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. I'm embarrassed now, Craig, because I think uh, <laughs> that kind of an introduction, I should be dead. You know, uh, <laughs> I appreciate everything you said. I'm just, uh, I, I just think if I, if I comment and uh, we should end the interview here, I think I'm just going to mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh man no i appreciate uh, you calling yeah uh, you know, the pleasure is mine i really enjoy, i'm not an acoustic guy but when i watch you play it's like you can't not it's like you got to stick and it's so much to learn and just enjoy just by what because you're not like you know i'm a rock and roll and a blues guy in my mind i can tell by your the wall behind you okay You've got some great electric guitars up there okay so like in my mind and like i think of a i grew up in new york city so i think of acoustic guitar players like down in Greenwich Village, but that's nothing like what you're doing, man. You're, you're, you know, you what, you, and we'll talk more about how you do what you do. But this is a like an experience just to watch you play. I, I was just, I'd never seen anybody play a guitar like that, an acoustic, anyway. So, 
Uh, let let me ask this: Were you always an acoustic player first, or was or did you start on electric? Um, the answer to that is that uh, yes and no. I, I I didn't start on one or another. Uh, I started on both. Uh, you know, I mean, originally I wanted to play the drums, uh, so I campaigned very hard for that with my parents, and uh, uh, I, uh, they refused <laughs> to buy me a set of drums. Uh, since we had nine children in our family, they thought that the addition of a drum Whoa. set might not be the best idea. Uh, so what I did was, you know, just to try to get the point across, you remember those miniature pool sets that you used to have as a kid with the short cues? Yes. Well, I would use those short cues as drumsticks and bang on our trash can top uh, just to show them that I was, you know, uh, serious, uh, but it didn't do the trick. What they did was they bought my older brother and I two acoustic guitars. You remember the Sears catalog? Are you mm-hmm. that old? Yeah, I'm 54. Uh, well, you understand how important the Sears catalog co- uh-huh. When that came to the house, the Christmas catalog, it was, it was, uh, <laughs> it, it was just, uh, you know, uh, an amazing uh, epiphany. So my parents got in there, and if you recall, Sears was where you got your, your inexpensive guitar if you're not a Fender. My parents weren't going to pay uh, you know, to go down to the music store, but they could order from the catalog two harmony semi acoustic guitar, uh, semi uh, uh, F hole guitars, uh, one uh, light, light sunburst, one dark sunburst. So we got guitars for Christmas, and so reluctantly I switched over. There you go. Now, uh, that's, the, that's the very beginning. But, you know, uh, uh, you know, I was in Los Angeles. I was born in Hollywood. I grew up in uh, Redondo Beach. Um, I was in the middle of, um, I'm trying to think back now here. I should have my notes together, Craig, but I'm just working from the hip. Uh, uh, so, so I'm in a spot, I'm in Redondo Beach where the surf music scene Mm. is it, it, that's the epicenter my friend and uh uh you know the uh the challengers the surfaris uh, the pyramids with pipeline the uh, this was huge our local band was you know who they were the beach boys they mm. were in lawn lawndale right next door to me uh they were doing they were practicing in their garage still in on hawthorne Bull, off of hawthorne boulevard i was right in the middle of that uh, catalina music was uh, where I walked down to uh, uh, down to the Esplanade on the sh- on the beach uh, after every day after school because uh, Fred and Alice, who owned Catalina Music, Craig uh, uh, would give jobs to all the surf musicians between gigs. You know they needed some extra pocket money, so they would you know let them work behind the counter and whatever sweep up the back. So in the couple of years that I was hanging out there I met everybody in the surf music thing very inspirational to me so you know I had to get an electric guitar uh, so um, uh, I saved money uh, working odd jobs and my father drove me down to the valley San Fernando Valley uh, to a furniture store uh, only old people are going to remember that at a furniture store Craig you know they often had a music section with organs and a few guitars so they drove me down to a furniture store. I can't remember what it was, uh, what the name of it was. But you remember that movie uh, that Tom Hanks produced, a great film called The Thing You Do? Uh, oh, about th- something with music or the band. Of course. It? Yeah. Of course. It was, the, it was a great film about a, uh, a band having a hit uh, out, of their, out of their little hometowns, One Hit Wonders. Uh, so you remember that uh, the main character's dad owned a furniture store. And so uh, there was musical instruments there. And so my father drove me to this furniture store in the valley, and I, and I bought a Fender Telecaster. Oh. So I always played acoustic and electric. Uh, and But the thing is, is that I really concentrated, you know, because right in the middle of the surf scene, the Beatles exploded. Mm. You know, the, their atomic power exploded the surf scene, of course. It blew up everything, just like Elvis blew up country music when he arrived when, when, when elvis arrived uh like a uh, an atomic detonation um uh, what he did was nobody wanted you know corny country music they wanted rockabilly mm. and so it, it really really put a lot of bluegrass acts and country acts out of business well same thing with the beatles uh as soon as they arrived uh everybody wanted to hear that and so um 
I did concentrate on the electric guitar. And when I did my first recording sessions, which I guess we'll talk about, I started in Los Angeles and I was an electric guitar player. I only played acoustic if they if they asked me to. But so I, I, I was an electric guitar guy until I drove from California to Nashville to join the Newgrass Revival. At that point, I was an acoustic guy. And as I hunkered down over the acoustic and tried to catch up <laughs> with the zeitgeist and with everybody, um, you know, I was thrown in with Sam Bush, Bela Fleck, and John Cowan. So my learning curve had to be quick, quick and steep. And so from that point on, nobody ever associated me with the electric guitar. Uh, and that's why everybody was surprised when I played with Leon. But I've known Leon for years from L.A., and he knew I played electric. Um, I'm still stuck on – I had nine kids in my family. Ah, uh-huh. uh-huh. that was twenty minutes ago. Yeah, I, the, I, that, that's me taking the scenic route it, to the point, Greg. It's, it's 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 so Irish families in California. The same Irish, as Irish, Irish, fam- Irish families in the Bronx. Then where I grew. Yeah. Up. <laughs> oh, oh, sure. Well, we my family was out of Chicago, uh, okay. which is the second which is the second capital of Ireland, right? You yes. have Dublin and Chicago, <laughs> and I guess New York. You're yeah. right uh, in the Bronx, but yeah. uh, but the thing was is that I was the first member of my family to be born in California because my father was transferred uh, from Chicago uh, to begin working at uh, Atlantic Richfield Oil, okay. which, as you recall, was a major oil big company. company yeah, real big yeah, company. Yeah. So, yeah. okay, so how did you get hooked up with the guys at Newgrass Revival? Like, if you were out in L.A., how did they, I mean, did you play with them or? Well, uh, it's an interesting story, Um I'm trying to think, how can I make it brief? Well, the point is that I had left L.A. because I was looking to, you know, I had started doing sessions, okay? Uh, and the reason I started doing sessions, if anyone's interested, uh, in L.A. is I had a connection. That's just always how it works, right? Mm-hmm. My uncle was a Beverly Hills attorney, and he represented some music people, including Frankie Lane, Frankie Who. Who at the who in the fifties was one of the hugest <laughs> uh, singers in the world, as you know, Craig. Frankie Lane, uh, you might remember Rawhide. Yeah. You might remember uh, remember the theme song to the G- Gary Cooper uh, Oscar movie uh, uh, um, uh, High Noon. That's a little Dude, before uh, my time. Oh, you remember High Noon. It's one of the great films of all time. But he sang the lead in that. Uh, Do not forget me, oh, my darling. So Frankie Lane was, was huge. And by the 60s, like I said, when the Beatles came along, uh, you know, that all went away. But he still owned a publishing company. And my uncle got me a job as a gopher there. And so, um, you know, what, what that means, you know what a gopher's job is. I it's do. Good. I was a gopher in New York, yeah. man. Since yeah. Well, good for you. Just, was you it hunt. a music Was it a music industry uh, job? No, it was just like a messenger. You know, I'd pick up packages yeah. here and bring sure. it over there. You, know? you get sandwiches for lunch. You get coffee for people. Now, here's how it worked in those days. And uh, it's where I started to meet people. And uh, here's how it happened. My uncle got me in the door. Uh, he uh, represented Frankie Lane. Frankie Lane's son-in-law ran the company for his father-in-law. And that son-in-law was Marshall Lieb, who was Phil Spector's partner oh, wow. in The Teddy Bears, who had a hit when Phil was 18 years old with To Know Him Is To Love Him. I do remember that. That was song. a huge hit. That uh, Emmy Lou and Linda Ronstadt and Dolly uh, really cut years later for a, another big hit. So Marshall Lieb was also a member of the Hollywood Argyles, who had a big hit with Alley Oop, which you recall. Uh, boy, I'm going back. So here I am. I'm working as a gopher. But you know what I'll do, right? I'll bring the guitar in once in a while when things are slow. And I'll be back in the back room playing. And I'll be letting everybody in there know that I play the guitar, right? Without saying anything, right? Now, this what do you do in this office? Well, all the writers who are signed to this this publishing company are songwriters. And what do they do? They come in every day and they work in their cubicles, just like Don Kirshner's office in New York, where Carol King worked with all of her mm-hmm. peeps, right? All the great writers that came out of Kirshner's office. That's called Tin Pan Alley. Well, our Tin Pan Alley was Sunset Boulevard, and there I was at Frankie Lane's Publishing Company. Now, the writers were very successful, um, and uh, they'd come in 
with their oh, and work on songs. You'd hear three or four writers banging on pianos. Every cubicle, I say cubicle, they were little rooms, mm. would have a would have a, a piano, Craig, and they'd have a cigarette ashtray, and and a, and a pencil and, and a pad. That's not much else. Maybe a window. So I'd come in, and there'd all be writers in there working on songs. So every, every time I walked down the hall, I, I was listening to major uh, blue chip songwriters working their craft and so i was you know of course i started writing songs as soon as i started playing that all came at the same time and um there was there was my opportunity now now the writers like i said they'd come in and work on it or they wouldn't come in but the fact is that every friday the head of the uh, the head the head guy the the guy that cracked the whip on the writers whose name was bob stone who wrote Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves. For share. For share. Um, he had the job of gathering up all the songs that were written during the week. And on Friday, there would be a demo session at uh, Sunset Sound where the stones cut satisfaction. I'm just trying to draw you a big picture here. And we'd go down, uh, they'd go, the writers would go down, and the studio musicians, who were the, basically the wrecking crew, they would be, uh, uh, and, you know, they, they would meet for their weekly demo session they would demo all the songs that the writers had written that week right and then the runners of the company would run out into this community and try to get those demos cut by major artists and there's the business right there that's how the veins work now they knew i played guitar just because i made everybody's acquaintance and i was a good kid and i kept my mouth shut my eyes open and uh i was a good gopher and uh one friday as i hoped craig <laughs> They were stuck for an acoustic guitar player because oh. because Jerry Cole uh, was it Jerry uh, it may have been Jerry Cole anyway somebody couldn't make it they, they some whatever happened he was sick or he was double booked doesn't I don't have any idea Bob came running in Pat he said uh, have you ever recorded before I immediately lied yeah of course sure I had never recorded before. Uh, but I said yes because that's what you say. Yeah. Why would Why would you say no? Yeah. And so I had no idea what was the <laughs> what What was the deal? But I said yes. And and he said, Well, listen, I'm stuck for this Friday. It was like Thursday. Can you meet me at Sunset Sound and be the guitar player on our next demo session? Wow. Of course, no big deal. As I as I had a heart attack, you know. Yeah, yeah, time. yeah, yeah. So my job the next day. Uh, was not just playing the guitar. That was the easy part. The problem for me was to walk into the studio looking and acting like I belonged there. Right. Nod and smile at the heroes that were the session players, that I, they were my heroes, mm -hmm. as if I belonged there. Sit down, and here's the, here's, the, here's the great part. Not just play, but have to read an arranger's guitar sheet. Uh, read notes. I never still not a good reader guitar players are not good readers craig because when we start playing we can just learn a chord and we can figure this out we don't we don't start with music and if you're, if you're a violin player if you're a horn player if you're a clarinet player your first day you're going to sit down with music yeah right. so that, that's why guitar players like james burton and glenn campbell never learned to read music so i didn't know that or i would have relaxed so <laughs> i i was humble enough to ask the other guitar player the electric guitar player to help me out which he did and I got through that session, and I started being their regular guy. So there's my beginning. Now, wow. I'm doing sessions in Hollywood. I'm working for people like Snuff Garrett, who's producing everybody, you know. And I'm working for Sonny Knight, who, uh, who produced uh, More Today Than Yesterday. And I'm working for Dallas Smith, who produced five man electrical band signs and bobby v come back when you grow up and i'm i'm just one of the i'm beginning to be one of the cats down there now i'm 19 years old i i you know so i got over some nerves and i got through some things and i became one of the guys but when i started to become 2021 and i wanted to be in bands uh you know i had to make a decision if i stayed in session work that was that was it that's a that's you know you can't leave and have another job. You've got to be available mm. when they call. Sure. If you're not available when they call, they move on very quickly. Just as they did with the guy who, who preceded you. Oh, yeah. That chair is very difficult to hold on to once you get it. Uh, as hard as it is to get it, it's harder to hold on to it. Uh, so I had uh, I put together 
um, you know, a band that got signed. Uh, I was I was asked by Buffalo Springfield's producers uh, to take the. You, you remember that Buffalo Springfield broke oh, up. Yeah. yeah. Remember that? I do. And Charlie Green and Brian Stone, uh, their producers and managers, they had a shoebox, and I'm saying shoebox because it was a shoebox full of cassettes of Springfield songs that were just done in the guy's kitchens as they wrote them. Some of them were half finished. So none of them were arranged. And I was asked to take those tapes, arrange them into songs and put a studio band together and sign them to Capitol records, which I did. Wow. What a cool project. That's a great project. And there's that record is still available out there. And there's a whole bunch of people on the underground out there who get on the internet and, and, and they think it's the lost Buffalo Springfield album that was that that never was supposed to be released because they broke up but it's not true it was it was a 19 year old kid with a bunch of session players and i i had arranged it by the way um that band was called yellow hand you could still get my work uh all you got to do is go online and say yellow hand they're still available i don't know who's getting the money they're being sold out of london you mean they're but, not getting, uh, they're not sending you checks that's so weird yeah right that's so weird <laughs> um Anyway, and then I put together a project with a band called Fresh Air as a kid, uh, still doing sessions, but I put together a project that got signed by Jack Gold in Columbia, and we had a, a couple albums come out. Uh, of, of Terry Melcher, the Birds producer, and Paul Van Raiders was a producer. David mm -hmm. Kirschenbaum, who produced Tracy Chapman, was another producer. So I was in the mix. I was trying to put records out, but I never had a band that where everyone... Uh, expanded the other, like the Eagles, or like the buff, like the Buffalo Springfield, like the like the uh, Burrito Brothers, like Poco. You see, yeah. I was very interested because not only were the Beatles my heroes, but so was Bob Dylan. So you put the Beatles and Bob Dylan together, and you get you know country rock or whatever you want to call it. But my idea was I wanted to be in a band, and I had to give up session playing to do it. But I couldn't do it in L.A. because every time I wanted to try to put guys together, the phone would ring. And the next two, three weeks was taken up with a project that I would do and I could need the money. So what do I do? I left L.A. and went to Aspen, Colorado, because I had a friend there who worked for John Denver. His name is Danny Wheatman. Danny and I were friends from uh, way back. And uh, he was living in Aspen playing fiddle, banjo, guitar, harmonica, auto harp and vocals for John Denver. And he said, come up to Aspen and... Uh, Put your band together, you know, and write your songs. So for two years, I lived in Aspen, and I put together everything. And I'm going to make a little bit of an analogy here. I hope it's not boring to anybody, Craig. But do you, I'm going to have to use a metaphor here of what I did. And this is how I met Newgrass. So I'm up there woodshedding. I've already left L.A. I've given up all the inroads I made as a session player. But I, I wanted to write, sing, be in a band. But... You know, and, and there was good guys up there. I had good guys playing with me. I had some of the best musicians up there, and I had a lot of fun. I don't remember a lot of it, but it was the 70s. <laughs> and uh, uh, hey, let me tell you why Aspen was a great place to play, Craig. So let's say you bomb one Friday night. Let's say you go up there and you just bomb. The next Friday night, Craig, you're going to have a whole different audience because uh, people come up to tourism. see you for a week, yeah. and they leave, and a whole new audience comes in Sunday night. Gotcha. So, so you could try anything, and you could experiment. It was the greatest place in the world. You know, comics from New York had uh, the Catskills, right? Yes. Yeah. The, right. The, you know, that's what that's what Jerry Lewis and, and Milton Berle used to say. The problem with comics today is they have got no place to to, to fail. How do you, how do you know that, uh, girl? Because that's a very like um, geo kind of thing. You know, you'd know that if you kind of lived there. How do, how did you know that? No. Well, first of all, because I'm a student of my craft, like everybody should be, and I've made a, a an intense study of pop music from the first hit, which was After the Ball is Over in 1899, to the current thing. I've, I've studied every facet of music. I know everything about the Greenwich Village scene. I know everything about the Catskills. I know everything about everything because I studied show business, popular music as an academic. Anyway, so back to the my thing here. I want to I want to tell you something about it. So here, there I am, and I'm I'm trying different things in Aspen. Um, 
and I'm getting a reputation with the band. We're all doing good. I'm making good money, and only part of it goes to the drug dealers, so I was kind of doing good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't think I slept in two years, but anyway. But you're now, young. Who needs sleep? Yeah. So let me tell you something before I tell you how I, how I turned that into an entree with, with uh, Sam Bush. I've got to tell you about Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Do you remember the movie? Yes. Yeah, sure okay. All right. Now stay with me. Do you remember? Do you remember um, the guy? Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, the, Richard uh, Dreyfus. Dreyfus. Thank you. Now Richard Dreyfus had a problem. Uh, he had a vision that was burned into his forehead. Remember, he was sunburned by that. Uh, craft and he had he had something burned into him that he was trying to express but he didn't know what it was do you remember every time he ran into mud yeah. or clay he kept trying to slap something together didn't he and yeah. he freaked everybody out his wife considered putting him in, a, in an insane asylum he was ruining his family life he was freaking out his friends because every time he would see something like dirt clay mud he jumped on it and tried to do something with it, but he didn't know what he was trying to do. He just knew he was compelled to do it. Now, that that was me. You see, I knew what I wanted to play. I knew what kind of a band I needed to be in, but it wasn't going to be a copy band. You know, I'm not going to do mm. Eagle Cup, but I'm trying to put the mud together, Craig, but I don't know what I'm after. And then, if you can stay with me right there, and I alienate a lot of people. I got good players come in and I say, ah, no, thank you, man. And then well, what's wrong with me? Nothing. You're great. It's just not what I want. Well, what do you want? Well, I don't know, you know, but I, I'm trying to put it together so I'll know it when I hear it. Now, a guy comes to me who sees my show and he comes up to me after the show. He says, hey, Pat, I'm Fred Shellman. I'm the director of the Telluride Bluegrass Festival. I never heard of it. it just started. Uh, I mean, Telluride, which is about an hour, two hour drive from Aspen through the mm -hmm. mountains south. He said, would you come and play on my festival? I said, sure. I said, who do you got? And he said, well, it's always headlined by New Grass Revival. I said, great. I don't know who that is, but, uh, you know, great. So I go to Telluride to, you know, bring my band, you know, to do my thing. It went over well. Uh, there's still there is still video of it shockingly it happened last year in july uh it, all of a sudden it showed up on um, youtube of, you, of you, you, you playing at the telluride festival yes as as the lead singer of crossroads that's that's wild all right so anyway i'm sitting down in front i'm watching the acts they got norman blake they got john hartford these are progressive bluegrass people i didn't know what progressive bluegrass was uh, of course i had an idea but i didn't know the major players they got pete rowan you know, you know what to expect now, but at the time, we're talking late 70s, right? I'm not sure what kind of festival this is. I didn't know what to expect. And all of a sudden, I sit down and Newgrass Revival comes on. You see, Craig, when I heard Newgrass Revival, that was when Richard Dreyfus saw a picture of the Devil's Tower in Wyoming. You see that mountain? So that, that, that was what you were looking for the whole time. I turned to my friend, Scott Myers, who was uh, my co-leader of the band. I said, Scott, I just saw Devil's Tower. This is what I've been trying to do all along. I knew everything they were doing. I had an intimate knowledge of w what they were doing, and I never saw them before. I, I knew exactly what they were doing. Sam Bush and uh, w was one of the best you know, bluegrass mandolin players on the planet, but he was up there singing uh, Great Balls of Fire. You see? Uh, they were doing Grateful Dead jams with banjos and dobros and fiddles. I knew exactly what they were doing. And I'd already started playing banjo and mandolin. I was trying to get that mud into shape, but I didn't know what I was doing. Now I saw it, and it became clear to me in a serendipitous flash, Craig. I knew, and I immediately went backstage and just fell all over those guys, you know? And they liked me and I liked them. And Sam said, well, why don't you, uh, we got about five more dates in Colorado, you know, after the festival. Why don't you come and open for us and we'll hang out. So I went to, you know, around Colorado. Let me, hold on. Let me actually interrupt yeah. you for one second. When yeah. he said that to you, yeah, was it some sort of like, yeah, I, I would imagine that you probably felt 
not surprised, but right. That's what's supposed to happen. No, I was on a mission. Yeah. As soon as I saw them, right. I knew what my mission and legacy were, but and I didn't care how or why it happened. I just knew yeah. that I had to be in that band. Well, so like when they said open, you, you probably said, okay, yeah, this is how it's supposed to happen. They're going to love and then me. They asked, and then they asked me to sit in, right. you know, after right. I opened. Sure. Then we got to know each other. Now, the connection to California, right? If I went back to California, basically I'd break it off with Newgrass Revival as far as hanging out because they live in Kentucky. Well, okay. it turned out because everything is going to work out when it's right. Yeah. Right, Craig? Yes. Everything is going to begin to click together as if you had planned it. They were working with Leon Russell at that time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I knew Leon from L.A., so I'd go over to the house when they were in town working with Leon. So, again, we're seeing each other not only in Colorado but in California. And then all of a sudden, again, I knew it would happen. I just didn't know how. Curtis Birch, wonderful guitar and dobro player for Newgrass, Dr. Dobro, and Courtney Johnson, one of the most influential banjo players and underestimated, in my opinion, they quit the band. Working with Leon had diminished the band. You know, first you open 20 minutes and then the promoter says, yeah, it's a little long. You know, can you cut it down? All of a sudden you're doing two songs, bringing Leon out. Now they come along and say, well, we don't have time for an opener. Why don't you just sit in with Leon? So they became absorbed into Leon Russell's orbit. And in 1974, just to remind some of your younger listeners, Leon Russell was the was Billboard magazine number yeah. one touring rock and roll act in the world. Leon was the number one rock and roll act in the world. That's all I can tell you. And uh, he was playing stadiums, and, and uh, he had Newgrass Revival as his band, So in, in his band. So, um, so Courtney and Cordes just kind of got burned out on that. They weren't playing music. They were really kind of getting way uh, distracted by the lifestyle. And, you know, they wanted to go back to Kentucky. They were just burned. They had it. So all of a sudden, it was Two Grass Revival with John and Sam. <laughs> Two Grass Revival. Well, that's the, they, they did a couple of gigs as a duo. It was, they called themselves Two Grass Revival, but <laughs> they had left their circuit. They had left the bluegrass circuit that they had, you know, that they had developed a reputation on. They were with Leon for four or five years, so all their contacts were gone. And then Courtney and Curtis quit, and they knew me from California, and they knew a young kid from New York named Bela Fleck because he as a smart kid, Bela's always been a very smart kid, he decided that when he did his first album, when nobody knew him, he would, he would hire celebrities to play with him, right? <laughs> so, well, that's smart. So his first album was uh, Bela Fleck with Sam Bush, David Grisman, you know, John Cowan, Peter mm. Rowan, you know, Tony Rice. So, so they knew Bela from New York, and John and Sam said, why don't we get Pat and Bela and revamp the whole group? And there you have it. Holy shit, what a story, man. I didn't know so Bela I, was from New York. Oh, yeah, I grew up in, are you kidding? He said, uh, you, know, he, you know, he said he, he, he never walked through Central Park as a school kid without getting beat up, beaten up. I had know? no idea he was from New York City. That's amazing. He, um, said first, he said, I'm from New York City. And he said, and then throw in that I'm a Jew and throw in that I play the banjo and throw in that I'm a little overweight. <laughs> and, you got a, and he said, you got a kid who was scorned his whole life, you yeah, know, he's, so he's made up for it. But, uh, oh, yeah. uh, the, so, so I packed everything in my dot, everything I owned in my Datsun pickup truck. And I left, uh, I left California. I left Los Angeles, uh, on October, uh, 13th, um, 1981. And I, we, we, and Bela drove from New York or actually he was in Lexington visiting JD Crow. So he drove down from Lexington and we all met, at John Cowan's mother's house in Evansville, Indiana, as a place where we could, you know, take over the house. His mother was thrilled to have us around and practice. We practiced for a week, but when I sat down, and you can ask anybody in the band, when we sat down to play, uh, Craig, um, we sounded as if we had played together for 10 years, the, so first, the first hour. So this is pure serendipity or divine intervention or whatever you want to call it at work. Well, this, this as was... soon as I saw them, as soon as I saw them play, I knew that the path would lead me to that moment. Wow. I was, I was thrilled, but I knew I just had to, it, it had to be Craig. I got goosebumps, man. What a, what a fucking great story. I yeah. mean, what an amazing and, story, Pat. And we did 10 great years together. And the really, really fabulous thing is that when we quit, we played our last gig 
on New Year's Eve with the Grateful Dead at o- Oakland Coliseum. We played our last gig. It was the uh, last night of the year. Obviously, it was New, Gra- uh, New Year's Eve. Mm. It was the last. Uh, uh, it was the last uh, uh, day of the year. It was the last day of the decade. Remember, eighty nine turning to ninety, and it was the last night of the band Newgrass. So that was a fairly momentous evening emotionally for us. Uh, but you can. But 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 here's the thing. I'm saying the most fab- fabulous thing is I thought everything we had done, television stuff, European tours, uh, records. I thought everything was gone. I mean, everything was out. You know, the, you know, nobody's going to keep stuff in print. All of a sudden. Years later, maybe what twelve years later, comes a thing called the internet, and now there are <laughs> well, now there's hundreds yeah. of hundreds of videos, literally, on YouTube. Every record we've ever done has been in print, it's still in print, no matter whether it's major label or the first one we did on Sugar Hill. Everything is still in print. Every TV show, every I mean, there's hundreds of live newgrass. So the most fabulous thing to me is that we've maintained. Uh, a, 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 a large group around the world of people who enjoy our music because of the internet and it's introduced it to new kids and I can't tell you that how great that is that your 10 years of work and the love affair that you had with those guys uh, is not uh, go- disappeared into the wind like I thought it was when what prompted the other two guys uh, you know Sam and John to yeah, I guess have the moxie to say, hey, we need to leave Leon. Or was Leon's thing winding down? Sam and John wanted to leave too, you know. But um, there's a lot of fetching things about a gig like that, Craig. There's oh, yeah. a lot. Of, you know what I'm saying? It's a lot of fun. You stay in, you know, you're not staying at Motel 6. You're at the Hilton. Sure. You know, you've got people doing everything for you. Your, cater, your food is catered. Uh, you have uh, lots of friendly people. Uh, that want to party with you. You're playing major uh, venues. You're with Leon Russell. So, but Kurt Cordes, Cordes, uh, Courtney and Curtis, they left. But you know, Sam and John were ready to go too. It's just that they just didn't quite. They couldn't quite let go. So they were stuck. And then the guys went home. That's when Sam said, "Okay, we're going to go ahead and leave, but we're going to put our band together first. <laughs> Leon didn't really appreciate that, but he yeah. knew that they were thinking about, re, uh, you know, re- redefining Newgrass Revival, and uh, so they, they so they left the band as soon as they had commitments from me and Bela Fleck. Wow, what a great story, man! Thank you for sharing that. That was yeah. that was awesome. Yeah. Ha- has um, have you ever experienced anything else? Anything else like that? That uh, what? It's almost like you're a clairvoyant, but you know what I'm saying, where, where you had so much of a premonition of, I got to follow my nose here. Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. It's not uh, a usual occurrence, and, and, uh, but I have to say yes. I mean, uh, when I saw uh, uh, my wife, uh, I knew I'd marry her for the first time I saw her. Uh, that's kind of like that moment. When I had my children, uh, I under- that changed me in a moment. Um, you know, but I, but I, I'd already, you know what? I already, um, I'd already seen, uh, that kind of change that didn't have anything to do with me, uh, Craig. Um, let me take you back to 1963. Now in November, a beloved president was murdered in the streets under, 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 under shaky circumstances. Um, and the country, this was in November. Um, it was about a week and a half after I was born. Okay, okay, very good. I happened to be in early grade school, uh, but uh, uh, the, the country stopped functioning. Uh, I, I want to say, I want to paint it in just metaphysical terms, the country was gray and black. We were deeply in mourning. There was no real Christmas that year. Uh, certainly the kids uh, sailed through it, but I noticed very well that everybody was <clears throat> sad, they were mad, they were lost. Kennedy was something a lot more than they knew when he was just a president and politician. I mean, after he died, they realized that he had saved the world from thermonuclear war in 1962. 
uh, during the Cuban crisis against every single Joint Chiefs of Staff, military leaders, State Department, uh, everybody wanted him to do to bomb uh, Cuba, which would have gotten a reaction from Russia, of course. Uh, but uh, he decided on a blockade. That's another story. But I want to tell you that when he died, they realized that we'd lost a Lincoln. Because you could say Lincoln, you could say very validly that, 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 the, that there was one man, one man amongst the millions who were involved in the Civil War. There was one man that held our country together through all the disappointments, and that's Abraham Lincoln. And uh, uh, so anyway, you got, a, you got a very bleak and dark country. Now, in the following February, you might see where I'm going. Uh, I was sitting in a world, in a house that was in mourning. They were... They were not motivated. Everyone was just moving in rote fashion. And on Sunday night, February 9th, 1964, the Beatles came on the Ed Sullivan show. And what I want to tell you is, because everybody remembers where they were or whatever when they first saw the Beatles, I saw them debut their act in America. And let me just tell you what happened. You remember the the uh, Wizard of Oz? Yeah. You remember the first part of that movie was in black and white, Craig, um, when Dorothy was on the farm and all the way through the for the through the the, the uh, tornado. But what happened when she opened the door when her cr- house crashed in Oz? What happened to the film when she opened her front door to step into Oz? You remember? Turns a color, right? The film changed to color. When I opened my door, the following day, Monday. After the Beatles were on. After the Beatles were on that Sunday night, when I opened my door and went out the door to school that next day, the world had completely changed. Wow. There was there was enthusiasm, there was smiles, uh, people were laughing. Every boy in school was furiously trying to comb their hair down and (laughs) get something out of that crew cut. Uh, Every girl uh, was was talking about which beetle they, they was the cutest. Uh, uh, the teachers, uh, the world was turned on its head. And the the minute I opened the door and went to the and walked to school, uh, the world had changed. So I had witnessed something like that happening. Uh, so it does happen uh, in our times. You you know you just have to remember those times that happened. So those things, yes, I, I I'm familiar with it, but. The Newgrass thing was something that I'm very grateful and humble about because I just could have easily not found what I was looking for, but I did. Wow, man, I, I, that's just—I I don't know. I, I'm like kind of speechless. I don't really know what to say. That was just an amazing the way that all all played yeah. out. Right. Um, okay, so what? What was without being like gossipy or anything like that? That's not the, sure. the angle of my question. What happened that new grass, or at least your tenure, new grass, or your your iteration? Uh, you know, like Deep Purple one, two, three. You know, yeah. new grass two, uh, right. t- Terminated or wound down. Yes, yes. Well, you know what? It is technically new grass two, but we so changed the band yeah. that, uh, you know, the majority of our fans were not aware of the earlier uh, I did, iteration, uh, like you said. Uh, um, so it, it, we really became visible on a mm, more of a major stage. So, so it wasn't that we were working against that particular thing. Um, uh, but you're asking a question about the breakup of the band. Well, there's no more. There, there's no real great story in that. We played for ten years together. Uh, we recorded. We wrote. We traveled the world. We were in 24 countries, beside the United States, or I guess including. And um, uh, you know, the State Department. The reason we were in so many countries, the State Department picked us, uh, among others, to represent America, traveling all around the country. They would not send you. Uh, the State Department discovered us on Austin Sea Limits, and they called us. They're, they're not going to send you to England or France because you could already get your own gigs there. Uh, where the State Department would send you was Africa, um, Sri Lanka, um, uh, 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 the Aegean, uh, Malta, uh, Asia Minor, Turkey. Uh, you see what I'm saying? They're going so to the send State you Department where, set these gigs up for you? Yes, because in those days there was budget and there was a thing wow. called the USIA. It was called the USIA. It was a CIA cover, you know, to to have eyes and ears 
in places where they didn't have staff. Well, we were not involved with the CIA, and I only found out later that the USIA was a, uh, it was called the U.S. Information Agency. And we, uh, I, I found out later during my, during my study of the Kennedy uh, assassination that uh, the CIA, that was one of their things. Uh, we, we simply did what they call cultural exchange. Sure. We didn't have, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we yeah. were not asked to do anything. You understand? Uh, uh, so totally. Yeah, they yeah. would so, they would send musicians from Africa over to us, and we would go over there. They, we, we did a simple artist exchange, but we were able to play for thousands and thousands of people around the world. And all I was going to say is we played for 10 years, and at the end of that 10 years, you have... You know, you you know, the, you love the guys, but um, you're ready to, to move on. I mean, sure. Bela Fleck was ready to enter the jazz genre uh, and do his Fleck tones thing years before he did it. You know, he mm. he stayed in the band. You know, but um, he was more than ready to be his own band leader. Um, John Cowan had been getting overt <laughs> uh, offers from major labels to do more of a rock record. You know, they didn't understand why he was in a band with a banjo, uh, <laughs> but they knew that his voice would sell. It was just that uh, we had developed our own, and this is a, anybody who's been in a band, um, I'm just talking, they know the story before I tell it. Uh, you reach a point where um, you, you just need to do something different. Uh, you know, uh, there, there were, yes, there were personality conflicts, but that happened since day one. Uh, I always well, thought that, that we were happens like, in any relationship where you're that close. Right. I mean, I'm sure, how long have you been with your wife? Um, 30 years. You probably had an argument or two, right? Maybe. Maybe a little <laughs> disagreement here and there. Uh, but, you know, yeah, Glenn, that, that's normal. Glenn Fry used to call the Eagles, uh, uh, he said, we, we're music's Oakland A's. And what he meant by that was yeah. when the Oakland Athletics won like three World Series in a row, yeah. they, they were so, they hated each they other hated so much they other. had yeah. fist fights in the dugout. You remember that? Yeah, I do remember they that. They had fights in the locker room and fist fights with the managers and the players. But when they got on the field, Craig, they became an unstoppable uh, force because their talents complemented each other's. Uh, and, and I think that we, I understand what, what Glenn meant about that. And I, we were kind of like that. We were four completely disparate personalities but when we got together on stage we grew a fifth leg man yeah. i mean it was what what's the old cliche something more than the sum of the parts yeah, yeah. I, I really think you can say that about newgrass revival it just happened to be musically something that was extremely exciting and fun for not just the audience but for us every night you know when you're in 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 as much in improvising as we did to throw the ball back and forth between Sam and Bale and I every night, you know, it was a world series, you know, it was just, uh, and we, and we challenged each other and we, we dared each other and, and we, you know, everybody had to really bring their, their a game. We didn't have a lot of autopilot in mm -hmm. that band, you know, I, I want to ask you, uh, what you did next but before i just want to know what was it like playing with the dead because that you know that's another you know i saw them in 77 yeah um i was never like a deadhead but what an experience that was was there something else involved maybe but uh you know what was it like playing you know being around them what, what was the scene like in general well you have to remember that i only played with we only played with them once now Bela was <laughs> walking around saying, hey, you know, uh, the Flectones will be available. They wanted to take Newgrass on tour with them. But uh, we said to them after we played them for the, with them that night at New Year's Eve at Oakland Coliseum, we said, they said, God, you guys are great. We, know, we want to do gigs with you. We said, well, we're breaking up. <laughs> so um, that didn't work out. But here's the thing. You just said it. You said it was a great experience. I could not be a dead fan really because musically it was too messy you know yeah you know what i'm saying i couldn't no, i totally you know, just, yeah it's it's you it's know too, but yeah. i understood that it was a great experience because you know it wasn't just a show it was a community of people who traveled around together and who traded shows with each other and and it was like it was like this extended family mm. and i thought that was super i thought that was great and i was a hippie thing uh, the, but but to be real honest with you, I had, I had my wife and I were she was pregnant with our first child, 
And uh, it was one of those gigs I wanted, to, you know, we all wanted the girls to come out to. We didn't take them on the road with us. Well, Sam did, but anyway. Um, but I wanted her to come out, and I was so afraid that somebody was going to spike her. You know, and, and my kid was going to be born, you know, with a green head or, or, or three arms. Um, because the way they spiked people, you remember the dead were famous for spiking yeah, people, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were famous. They, were, they would plan on how they were going to spike this guy or that guy. And what they were doing at the time, the Grateful Dead fans would load up their squirt guns, see, with water and acid, and they would squirt people. Now, yeah. you understand that acid gets into your skin. You can get, you know. Well, you just yeah. don't need your pregnant wife around that stuff. I really worried about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah I totally get but that. But it turned out to be a total, it turned out to be a total um, uh, a not, non-worry because I remember, I'll always remember, I'll always remember being on stage for that show. I want you to picture this. I'm on stage with the dead. Uh, excuse me, with New Grass Revival. We're opening for the dead. I'm standing on stage at the Oakland Coliseum. There's a whole other show outside to the 5,000 people who couldn't get in. They have a big screen outside in the parking lot, Craig, and they're watching the show. Uh, but, but, but anyway, as I look out into the audience, I see 14-year-old kids, 10-year-old kids with tie-dye T-shirts on. I see lawyers in $500 Armani suits. I see housewives and bankers and mechanics. The audience was an unbelievable shock to me because I'd never seen an audience as eclectic or diverse as mm. that in my life. I'd never seen it. I'd, now, I can imagine you go to a Paul McCartney concert, right? Same thing, right? Uh, sure. But the, dead, but the dead had every generation and every socioeconomic level. Okay, now, I'm on the stage. I'm playing guitar. On my right-hand side, sitting on the stage, looking up at us, was Bonnie Raitt. On the left-hand side of the stage, sitting on the stage, looking up at us, was Jane Fonda. And so we came out and did our thing, and it was thunderously received. I'm just saying that because it's true. The Grateful Dead fans who <laughs> half Wait, of no, them no, I would. Your music is very compatible with a dead well, entourage. They dug it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I knew 100%. that they would dig it because we we used to play the the uh, Strawberry Festival in Yosemite, California, and so we had a lot of Deadheads come and dance in front mm. of the stage for us. So we, they knew who we were. But I'm just saying let's say half at least of that audience had never seen us before obviously sure. um and uh, probably three quarters or whatever but the point was they did go for it yes they understood what we were doing it wasn't like we were opening for ronnie Millsap and they were going what the fuck <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> we when we opened for him, sam used to say uh i said sam is going to be a tough gig he said well pat just go out there before the show and count the hats <laughs> the more hats he got out there, the more trouble we're in. Because <laughs> we'd open for George Strait or Reba McIntyre. We'd open for the, the, the Judds. And when we opened for a mainstream, mid, you know, all-American Joe Sixpack audience, they had no freaking idea what in the hell we were trying to do. Yeah, it was yeah. really funny. Anyway, now here's the last thing I want to say about the Dead concert, because this will be, uh, this will be good information for some folks out there. When I told you earlier that I was just kind of heartbroken that everything we had done was going to go out in the air and disappear as we broke up, uh, and, I, and you remember I said that the uh, internet came on yep. and sa saved it all, but listen to this. Uh, I'm playing a show with Daryl Scott and John Cowan. We did a bunch of shows as a trio uh, years later, and a guy came up to me. I'll never forget this. It was so funny. Guy comes up to me and says, hey, man, I was at the Dead concert that you played. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember that, Pat? I said, of course I remember it. He says, well, do you have a copy of the show? And I said, well, no, of course not. He said, you want one? Wow. And all of a sudden, I thought, what are you talking about? He said, well, man, Dead record everything. You know that. The Dead, the dead tape everything. Everything. I said, well, yeah. He says, so Dead fans have got your show and they trade it around. I said, are you serious? So as soon as I got a copy from this guy, which wasn't a great mix, but it was fine. Uh, I was so happy. And then two weeks, maybe two weeks after I got a copy from this fan, Capital called me up, called us up and said, we want to take a bunch of the stuff from your dead show and put it with a bunch of your other live things and some TV things and put out a new grass revival, uh, record called, uh, roots. And Very it's still cool. available. So it's like a, Capital EMI. assorted greatest hits plus. Yes. Well, it's it, it, the first CD is all the old band, Curtis, Curtis, uh, Curtis uh, and Courtney. And the second CD is all the new band with 
stuff that you wouldn't get on a record. Live things, TV things, and that included most of our set with the dead. So not only does it still exist, but it's very well remixed and remastered to, uh, and it's available. It's called Newgrass Revival Roots on Capital EMI. That's awesome, man. Very cool. So there you go. Now, um, so let me let's do this. Let me ask you this, yeah. Pat. Um, I think it, you should go ahead while I try to try to. I, I'm going to talk to you, but I'm going to be trying also to hook us up off the uh, ears. Oh, pl- okay, yeah, okay. If you could, if you could, if you think, if you think you could do that, do you, do you want me to pause yeah. while you're doing that, or you want to talk no. while you, you keep going? I think you should go ahead just in case. Okay, so the band is over, and yeah. I think you mentioned to me before that at that time you said, okay. I'm back in Nashville, and I want to, you know, I I've got to figure out what's Pat Flynn part two here. So you start doing some more. You want to start doing some more session work. Is that accurate? When I came back home, I was in a bit of a spot because I had just bought my first home. Uh, my wife was seven months pregnant with our first child. How many kids do you have altogether? Three. What I mean, did, can you even look at your parents with just three kids, Pat? Oh, I was planning on having no kids <laughs> after my experience, you know, but uh, no, no, I don't recommend nine kids to anyone. It just happened to be the era, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's a whole story in itself. But uh, I went back home and I was in a bit of a bind. See, I had already gotten my feet in the ground, as I told you. And by the end of the band, I was doing 200 days a year with new grass on the road, but wow. I was also doing almost 100 days a year with, with the session. So I, like I said to you, I needed to turn that into a full-time job. Mm. And it took a few years. That's why I went back to school. I didn't bowl and I didn't play poker. So I needed something to fill my time. So while I worked on turning my sessions into a full-time job, uh, I went back to um, uh, university and I got a master's degree. I got an undergraduate degree in um, psychology and I got a master's degree in religion, philosophy, epistemology. Uh, what is so, epistemology? Uh, I don't even know what that is. Epistemology is a word that means what's true. Now, and, and how does how do you how does one go about discerning what's true or what's relative? You see. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, like a, a, a part of philosophy or deduction and logic. It's 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 half of philosophy. Philosophy. Uh, science answers the questions of, of how and when, does it not? Mm-hmm. Does. Yeah. Philo- philosophy attempts to answer the question of why. Why, yes. And, yeah. and to what end. Uh, I used to say uh, to people that, uh, that I'm doing a master's in that, and they say, what's that? And I say, well, it's like bowling, <laughs> except that uh, the pins that we use are existential presuppositions that we try to knock down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, and, that, yeah. And, and that was a satisfactory answer, I'm sure. To me, it was. Yeah. I don't know that they <laughs> answered their question, but that was my answer. Uh, but it was very fascinating. I really, I didn't want anything, because people would assume I went back to school and studied music. Well, that's the last thing I wanted to do. Mm. Um, you know, I felt like I'd had a I was decently educated in music, uh, but um, I did want to do something because I, you know, I was in love with books my whole life. So I was ready to do a big picture thing, and I kind of dove in the deep end. What? Okay, so did you ever do anything with outside of like you, you know, personal enjoyment? Did you ever? Yeah. Was there a, a career or a practice or an application of that in, in well, business? Well, people. People who are uh, who major in those areas are looking for an eighteen thousand dollar a year entry level job at a state university. You know, so uh, I always told people, uh, Craig, that uh, I wanted to pick something that had had absolutely no socially or financially redeeming qualities. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, there wasn't much to do. Yes, I have taught classes and done seminars. Yes, uh, but uh, I've I haven't ever left music uh, to this point. So I really have had no time to make a career out of it. Uh, perhaps when I get older, uh, perhaps I'll teach, but I have no, I've been busy with music from day one and I still am. So I don't know that I'll do anything with it beyond, like you said, from my personal, uh, you know, and I, and I, I learned a lot, but the, but the problem is with learning a lot in those areas is that uh, if somebody asks you a question and you attempt a deep answer, uh, you always get the same reaction. Look at the time. Wow, look at the time. <laughs> anyway, n- nice seeing you, man. Uh, they're really you know, not. You know, that what? I, I have an I have an idea. When you're finished yeah. at music, you ring yeah. me up, 
because I'm a marketing guy and we get together yeah. and we make you like um, Elmer Gantry. You ever see that movie or that read that book? Are you kidding? Burt Lancaster. Yeah. Man. So we, we make you like, uh, you know, and, a traveling and. preacher and, and we start a uh, not for profit. Yes. And, and I think there's something there, Pat, with, okay. with your gift I, of in. the gab. I think I think there might be something in this. <laughs> Hey, don't forget, when you talk about Elmer, Elmer Gantry, yes, Burt Lancaster, but also a 21-year-old Shirley Jones. Yes, that's yeah, right. The par- partridge mom. Mm. But if you saw her 21, call me later. Yeah, she's a knockout. She was a oh, knockout. my gosh. It was it was unbelievable what she was on the screen. Yeah. Anyway, so um, okay, so what you, I, you, you get your yeah, degree and then you go and you start and it said it took you like three or four years till you're able to convert session into full time. Yeah, and, and and once I did that, then uh, I assumed that I'd have a few good years as a session player. Remember, I had experience. Yeah. Uh, remember, I had experience in L.A., so that was one thing. I knew my way around a recording studio, and you know, the word zeitgeist is a word that, that I use a lot. But, uh, it's kind of a funny word. All that means is the spirit of the times. It's like uh, it was time for it, right? It was time for it. Sociology sociologists uh, talk about the Beatles happening because it was time for that. They couldn't have made it in any other particular time. It just happened to be the right timing. Uh, so what I'm telling you is that uh, when I was in Nashville as a part of a band, I wasn't looking to become a studio musician. First of all, that circle of wagons was tight. Yes. And uh, you know, and those A-team guys were not going to let anybody else in. They honestly would just freeze you out. So I didn't even think about it. Uh, and then when the band broke up, all of a sudden, all of the country artists at the time were, were over the hill. The audiences were over the hill and not buying records. There, there was death. There was a death. That was a time the Opry was going to shut down. The Grand Ole Opry was going to shut down. It desperately needed new blood and it never pre-planned for new blood. They were happy with who they had. All of a sudden, Johnny Cash and Barbara Mandrell and, and, uh, you know, Porter Wagner and they were all 70 years old. So all of a sudden, one night, it seems like I got up one morning and all of a sudden, it seems like this, I know it's not true, but it seems like all of a sudden, one not, one day I, I went down into Nashville and everybody that was writing songs, publishing songs, uh, uh, into acts that were signed, studio musicians were all my age. And I thought, what happened? Well, they wiped the slate clean one night, you know, the labels and the, yeah. and the you know, they just said every. We need a whole new crew. So I walked right in the door of sessions, uh, and I was, uh, and I was, I was, I was lucky. You know, it was a time, but I had to be willing. I had to be ready to play, and I was one of the few guys who was in an act who was also working as a session player. Um, and what I'm saying is that I figured on a few good years because the fact of the matter is, and you know, people who know what I'm talking about, they already know this. Uh, it's a it, 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 session playing is a it, 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 it's a uh, session playing is a, uh, uh, um, I can't, I just lost the word. Uh, the guy that, that shoots out in high noon, uh, it, it's a, a gunslinger. Thank you. Uh, session playing is a gunslinging op, uh, occupation. Mm. It, it's, it's not an occupation where you get the 401k and you, you know, you move up in the ladder and, yeah. you know, yeah. no, you stand in the street and you fire away. And you're the hot guy until until somebody walks around the corner and uh, takes the chair. Um, that's what session playing is. It's always been that way. That's why the Wrecking Crew and the A-Team in Nashville and the, uh, the guys, remember the Motown movie, Shadows of Loves? I don't uh, remember that guys. movie, but I know those guys in Motown were bad. Yeah, the asses. Motown players. That's why they're so special, because they were session players for 10 or more years. That That's just... Don't you know it's it's a gun slinging operation. So, I did fifty. Uh, I did eighteen, almost twenty years of it, and I and I every time I thought, well, this can't go on, but it kept going on. So, uh, just for the country music got hot. That was part of it. While I was in the chair, all of a sudden, with Randy Travis, the Judds, and then Garth Brooks, Garthzilla, all of a sudden, country music went from a five percent piece of the pie, right, internationally. Sales wise, mm-hmm. it went if it, it went from a very loyal, small five percent of the pie. You know, it was like a Comic Con um, <laughs> to a twenty percent piece of the pie. Craig, uh, country music exploded worldwide, as you know. 
<laughs> and I was there when the gold rush hit. So it was all zeitgeist. That's why I use the word. Sure. And I, sure. I did sessions for many, many years. And when Brian Sutton showed up, I said to him, what, what kept you? Uh, I just didn't know that, uh, but I was already ready to move on. I was very much ready to move on into my own records and production at that point. So how did I did. I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. There were so many great moments as a session player. For example, um, just to pick a couple, um, I uh, I walked into the studio with Michael Murphy one day, and he was going to sing a duet with Marty Robbins. Uh, the great Marty Robbins. Well, the only problem was that Marty had died about seven years uh, before. <laughs> so I, I'm thinking, well, this would be interesting. Well, what he did was what he did was what Natalie Cole did with her daddy, right? Take the tapes out of the, the vault, record, yeah, and you overdub your daughter singing Natalie Cole singing with her dad, and it, it's uh, you know it's done with studio equipment. Uh, you got to get the original. Uh, a, a three track or four track, whatever it is, and then when Marty's was a three track, and then you put it to a sympty stripe, so where you straighten out the time, right? And then you overdub Michael singing with Marty Robbins. Okay, so that brings up an issue. So I walk in and he tells me what we're going to do, and he's going to cut El Paso and he's going to cut Big Iron, two of the greatest Marty Robbins songs ever. And there isn't a great Marty Robbins song without Grady Martin. You know that. No, I or don't, maybe no, you don't. No, I don't. Okay. Grady Martin was the greatest acoustic guitar player and electric guitar player in national history. With all due respect to Chet Atkins and to um, other other great guitar players, Grady was the A team's uh, leader hero. Uh, uh, when you when you think of Marty Robbins records and you and you think of all those beautiful Mexican Latin licks and all that stuff, uh, that's all Grady Martin. He did the first fuzz tone guitar. He did the first uh, anyway. So I went to Michael. I said, Michael, I said, um, you know, we've got an issue here. And he said, what's wrong? I said, nothing. It's just that Grady Martin played on these records. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, do you want me to play exactly what Grady played? Because I'll do that. Or do you want me to do something different? I don't know what to do. He said, well, just do what you feel. I said, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate the great, great advice. And I said, and, at the, and I said, by the way, I, I'm also thinking of rewriting Second Corinthians. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> and, you know, it's like it's like taking. It's yeah. like you're going to play with Buck Owens, right? Yeah, I, you got, I you got what Don, Don Rich to deal with, right? I if I play with Jackson Brown, you're going to be wanting to know what I'm going to add to David Lindley. Yeah. You understand? Totally without good, yeah. gr- without Grady Martin, there is no Marty Robbins records. Okay. That's like Don and Phil Everly. Uh, anyway, so what I did was we had a number one record with Big Iron, with Marty singing with Michael Murray, Murphy. And I did a part that was my own, but anyone who hears what I played on that record knows that I was, uh, that I was uh, playing a tribute to Grady like Martin. Honoring, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. And I had a ball to That was a great day. Uh, I've had other great days. I've had Randy Travis in my earphones. I've had Don Williams in my earphones. Uh, when Glenn Campbell came in to record his last number one record, he didn't know it was going to be his last number one record. It just happened to be. Um, he said, uh, Pat, I want you to take the lead on this. Wow. Now, this and is, said, you're playing electric or acoustic? With, with, with I'm playing acoustic, but it's kind of a bluegrass song, kind okay. of bluegrassy. And Glenn said, because I don't do that much flat picking, I said, Glenn, don't bullshit me. What are you talking about? And he laughed and he said, uh, he said, man, I just want you to do it. You're the guy. I said, okay, well, I'm sitting next to Reggie Young. <laughs> I'm sitting next to Reggie Young. And I said, I didn't know what to say, except I wasn't going to do this. I right. wasn't going to, I, I mean, I should have shut my mouth, but I said, Hey, Glenn, why don't, Reggie and I, you know, kind of just uh, trade off solos, you know. Mm. Oh, great, great idea, great idea. Okay. Um, and, and and I wasn't worried that he that he that he was awkward and say, saying that because you're in front of Reggie. No, I knew he would like it. Yeah. And and the truth is, after Reggie did a solo and I did a solo, and he yelled my name out before my solo, uh, scat Pat, he said, and I did the solo. Uh, and then he got <laughs> so excited. That he added a third solo himself at the end of the record, and we had a ball, and that was his last number one record. I also played on uh, Jerry Reed's last recorded record. Wow, what a player that guy was. Where Jerry, Jerry had me play lead while he hollered at me, son, go ahead on. <laughs> and uh, I've, had some, I've had some great days 
Craig, as a session player. I just want to tell you, uh, I loved it. The guys that play on sessions, who you don't know their names, or most people don't, are the funniest guys. The gallows humor, the black humor, is just the best because our humor is such is that way because it's like paramedics. If you ever hang around paramedics, they have the worst jokes. I mean, as far as being dark, yeah, be- because of what they deal with. Well, we deal with you know one bad record and you know you're out of business. You know. Well, you know what? Uh, it's interesting. I I know you know Jerry McPherson. Of course, I know Jerry. I I asked him, and I, and I. I've interviewed close to 200 people at this point, so I don't remember loads of answers, but I remember this one because it was very meaningful. And I said, what's the, what do you dislike about what you do most? Well, what's the thing that you dislike the most about what you do? And he said, song triage. Right, exactly. And I, you, get and, a, you get a song in there that's, that's crap. It's dead. You, <laughs> you can't stand gurney. up and say this is, this is crap yeah. because they don't want to hear that. They want to hear what you're going to do to save it. Yeah, and you got to just like breathe. And he said it has no right. It should be in the – it's a cadaver basically. You know, and yes, should, and, and you've got to get it stand up yeah. and sing. Yeah. And it's, it's meatball Never surgery. Never forget that. Let me tell you my favorite Jerry McPherson story real quick. And Jerry – Jerry, it's okay with Jerry that I tell the story because I've told it and he's told everybody in Nashville's heard it. But it's such a perfect statement just in microcosm. It's just a nutshell kind of joke. True story. Jerry goes in to overdub on a project. Now that means that the tracks have already been done. The musicians are gone. Now you're going to bring in the hot shots, the the killers. You're going to bring in the assassins to do the solos. And so you bring in Jerry McPherson. Now he comes in at six o'clock. Tracks have already been cut at two. It's a Christian band. Don't remember who they were. It doesn't matter. And they're all in the booth. And Christian bands are always in the booth. There's a producer. There's marketing people. And there's also pastor friends, you know, who are giving them spiritual guidance and this and that, blah, 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 uh, because there's catering. So anyway, <laughs> Jerry's in there, and he's it's 6 o'clock. Now, no one's talking to him, so he sets his stuff up. Uh, Kate, uh, Cartage has already set his stuff up, but he plugs in, and he's pushing his pedals and making sure his chords work, and he's turning his knobs, and... He's just mindlessly, you know, riffing, and he's got some heavy metal sounds going or whatever. He's testing out all of his stuff. He's just, uh, he's just uh, hanging out and noodling until somebody tells him what to do. Well, as he's noodling for a while, Craig, he looks around, and everybody in the booth is listening to him. There hasn't been any conversation yet, but they're all looking at him. So he stops, and he says, what? what, what, what what's going on? The, somebody pushes the button. And whoever the spokesperson was said, and remember, there's like 20 faces at the window. Uh, Craig, yeah, we were wondering if you could perhaps find a more Christ-honoring tone. <laughs> now, besides besides being hysterical, <laughs> that is such a perfect <laughs> session guy story because what you run into, Craig, is... You laugh till you cry. That's all I can tell you. That's a great <laughs> McPherson story. Oh, We've all got him, you know. Man, in doing hilarious. in doing triage. Yeah, that's hilarious. Um. Oh wow. Okay. So let me, let me let me say something about triage. Yeah, yeah. The, I, you know, if you go in there with the attitude of "I hope this is good," you know, uh, you got the wrong attitude. Uh, I don't care what I've played on. I've always learned something from anything I played on, no matter whether it was a good song or a wretched song. Um, uh, I go in with the single purpose of being a blessing to that song, trying to do something that will add to its, you know, being fetching, being popular, being, you know, you just, you've got to listen. And if you listen, you can find something to add to that song. And if you're going to be judgmental, you're in the wrong business. They're paying you to come in and with good faith, see, provide a service, give your all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, There's been guys who I've met along the way who were very, you know, they knew they were good players and they were full of themselves and they would make fun of whatever they were playing on. They didn't last very long. I can tell you that. It was interesting. I, I, um, you know, Rob McNelly, I'm sure. I I know the name, but I've never worked with him. I don't think. Rob invited me to a session when I was in Nashville a couple of months ago and I got to see firsthand what you guys do. And it was really amazing how... I mean, I tell people that's the that's the best value in music you could get, where you can go in there with essentially, if you wanted, nothing, yes, but lyrics, and these guys make a 
a song, a, a really good song that might be a hit for all you know. I know. You know? That's I mean, our job. It's just phenomenal. I, I mean, it's just mind boggling how that happens. It was just, well, you know, you know, I did, I've done sessions. I did sessions from 85, 1985 before Newgrass broke up all the way to around 2005 when we had twin tsunamis. Uh, the country had one tsunami in 2005, 2006, whenever it was, where the, co- where the economy collapsed. You remember that oh, very yeah. well. And everybody was hurting. And everyone's investments were gone and all that stuff. So you remember that. So that was one tsunami, and that's enough. You don't need more than one tsunami. Those of us in the music business had a second tsunami at the same time because some guy who lived in his mother's basement and who you know had a big L on his forehead... Yeah figured out how to download digital files illegally. Right. And that was the second tsunami where nobody was buying records. They were simply copying and downloading them. And with digital recording, you weren't losing generations of sound like you did. You know, you could copy cassettes, but they sounded like crap. So that was a... Sure. but, But so we had a second tsunami. And so that's the time that my that I decided to overtly move away from sessions which immediately collapsed to about 50 percent uh and set up my own company start doing my own records and looking around for groups to produce so i really so the guys you met that i started to get hot after that so my session thing goes from 85 to about 2005 after that i was in business everything has been business for myself let me ask you this because i'm i'm really interested in in this it's very difficult to become successful in one thing. Yeah. Okay. But you've been successful in multiple areas and it's rare. You've been successful as an artist with multiple instruments as a session player. Yeah. As a producer and as a songwriter. Right. So my questions are twofold. Number one, what's the, I was lucky enough to have a Garth Brooks among others record my songs. It's been great. Yeah. Well, well y- yes, you were lucky enough, but you wrote the songs that were good enough yeah. to get, rec- you know, it's, it, Pat, you know how it works. It's like you make oh, your own luck and yeah, there is a lot of serendipity, but there is. the bottom line is if the work ethic and the, you know, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, you know, if you don't <laughs> right. have a quality product, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Um, but my questions are, what's the driving factor for you in the sort of ongoing and the consistent pursuit of excellence in all these different areas? And the second part of that is, why do you think that factor exists? Like, what emotional need or appeal does that get for you to, to, to you know, accomplish, to be excellent in, in another area and in another right. area? right. Uh, those are, you know, that's the easiest questions you've asked me. Uh, all I'm so glad that you gave me an easy one because I really, you know, I try to I try to examine things and analyze things because I've done lots of interviews and, uh, you know, sometimes it's difficult. Like you said, uh, you don't really kind of know. It's kind of like somebody asking me, "How did you do that thing on the guitar?" Well, I have to look down and see. I, I got to look down and look at my hands because the answer is I just made it up on the spot. But he wants a better answer than that. Now, the easy part of your questions is. I'll answer them right. I'll just go boom, boom, boom. First of all, the answer is love. I, I have a, I have an overarching, transcendent level of love. Uh, you can equate it to human kind of being in love, but you remember the Greeks. You know, the, we have one word maybe for love. We got other words for lust, and we got other words for family love. And but the Greeks had different words, lots of different words for love. And there's a word, and one of the Greek words for love. Remember, remember, for the my masters, I had to, I, I had to not only pass Greek but Hebrew. Um, the Greeks have a, a, lots of words for love, and it's this, you know, it's just because you know how many different kinds of love. The one I like is agape, agape love. Agape love transcends physical attraction, right? It even transcends most, a lot of times, familial love. You know, like you love your mom, you love your dad. Agape love is this driving force. It's proactive. It doesn't sit still. It's restless. It needs reciprocation. So I like the word agape. Um, it's more like, a, ha- like passion for something as opposed to passion for someone. I think so, because it can, you know, it can go into other areas. But, uh, you know, Christians, I've, I've heard, use this word. And from way back uh, a couple centuries ago, not centuries, I'm sorry, a couple of millennia ago, uh, they used the word agape because, Chris, uh, because the Bible was originally written 
in Koine Greek. Uh, so you, 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 run a, you run into that term biblically, and I'm sure that's how I ran into it, studying Greek. My point is, I have an overwhelming love to express myself uh, in music, and so I can't do any other. I can't not do that. Uh, uh, secondly, y- y- the driving forces to reinforce that are, are, are typical of anybody. Uh, first of all, it's one thing to love what you do, right? But you also have to be a show-off, right? Don't you? Or you'd be happy sitting in your living room playing for your friends. You want to get out and show it. Well, a lot of people say, well, it's an ego-driven. Okay, there's some of that, but I don't like that answer. What I say is, mm-hmm. yes, of course it's ego, but that's too easy. What it is is love that needs reciprocation, Craig. Uh, um, okay. You know, I can't do on stage. You know, the times that, 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 that I've been with a band or someone, well, the times I've been on stage where there's been a standing ovation, right? You want to tell those people. You want to grab them and tell them, I couldn't have played like I just did if you weren't like you are. Yes. The love that's coming back to us spurs us to this great place where you hear a tape of it afterwards. You think, shit, how did I play that? You know, or you, you hear it. You can feel the vibe. Okay, so there's the answer to your question. It's love, but also it's a need. It's a hunger to, to, to perform and to write and to do music, but it's also a hunger and a neediness. I mean, just to admit it. Sure. To, to have it returned. So there you have the whole thing. Now, there's other little things that spur it. Fear. <laughs> Please love me, right? Because if you don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, sure. I don't, you know. So there's the answer to your question. I, I think it's a fairly easy question to answer. It's an agape love. It's a, it's a restless, powerful, overwhelming, transcendent need to express music and to have it heard and appreciated. Totally get it. Okay, so everybody pays tuition in whatever we do, you know, meaning we all make mistakes. And I was wondering if you'd be kind enough to maybe share one or two mistakes you might have made along the way of this musical journey. And, and what were the lessons that you learned from, that mis- from those mistakes? Let's see. Um, well, uh, of course, the first answer to your question is that... Uh, I think like, like everybody, or at least like most people, I wish I had done every single thing better. Uh, you know, uh, everything I've ever done, I, I thought I wish I could have done that better or, or uh, handled that situation or relationship uh, better or differently. And so, you know, I, you know, I've always been critical like that. Uh, but um, I'm trying to think now of something specific I can give you. Um uh, I think if I had it to do over again, I would be much more technically uh, aware or, or have educated myself technically in, in what constitutes what constitutes good tone. Um, you know, been much more knowledgeable about uh, different guitars, different pickups, uh, different picks, uh, different. Uh, I came to know those things over the years, but I spent a lot of time. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time um, uh, uh, flailing around when uh, I, I could have known more. Uh, so I really wasn't uh, technically uh, as, and I think I could have gotten ahead faster should I have been more aware and more uh, circumspect about uh, instruments and, and, and equipment and things like that. I just, that, that's one thing I guess as I look back. I think I also would have started earlier in uh, teaching myself to read uh, music. And uh, I taught myself music harmony and theory, and I educated myself, but really it was crash courses because the studio work descended on me quickly. And, you know, I wish I would have been more prepared because I could have done better work if I didn't have to, uh, you know, be reacting to music that was hard to read or whatever. Those are things I I would love to have done better. Um, I guess, uh, and the lesson simply is that, uh, you know, uh, luck may open a door. uh, But when that door is open, you know, you've got to be ready to walk through it. Uh, So those could help me, uh, you know, walk through the door a little bit better, quicker, something like that. Um, The only other thing I could think of is 
that um, all my relationships in life, uh, whatever they were, uh, were always um, prioritized below um, what I do. And um, that's caused a lot of uh, problems. And I think I could have handled all of that better. Uh, but, uh, you know, once your eye is set on the prize, you know, um, and, and you look back and you think, I, I, uh, I shorted that person. You know what I mean? I, I, uh, I didn't appreciate that moment or that person or that particular situation or relationship the way I could have, but I was too busy. I, I think it's a very egocentric business, you know, um, in a sense, you know, I talked about that before. Uh, and I really regret that. Uh, First of all, thank you. That's a very honest answer. I was curious, two things. How would have knowing instruments and the technical aspects of instruments better, do you feel that would have helped you? Well, because I think there were other guys uh, that were ahead of the game, and I didn't know why at the time. Uh, they seemed to have to be able to, uh, to play with a wider vocabulary and, and, and be comfortable in different situations. And what it was, was finding that this wasn't the right guitar to use or that wasn't the right amp to use or pickup to okay. use. And uh, I'm just not inclined to that side, but I've had to teach myself. And should I have gotten, if I could kick myself uh, in the pants a little harder to get on top of that, it wouldn't have been so difficult for me to get there. Gotcha. And as far as relations, I'm assuming you're talking about outside of your, your wife and kids. You mean like just general? No, no, no. I'm not leaving them out. I oh, okay. Could, you know, okay. I could have been a better uh, husband and father if I didn't have this monkey on my back, you know. Uh, this is something that, you know, uh, you know, there are some guys who can, you know, put the work down, uh, go home, right? Put the hat on the, yeah. put the hat, coat on the rack, and, and, and they'll be fully present. You know, I've never been fully present with anyone. Uh, if I've got something on my mind, a song that was half written or something that I was thinking of, or, you know, it always gets in the way of being fully present with people and it takes a toll. Man, I really appreciate you being so straightforward. Do you feel yeah. you, do you feel you're doing a better job of that now? Well, sure. Because now I'm not running all over the country and I, I don't have six or seven things going on and I run my own little company and, uh, and I can set aside days for work. And then set aside days where you know I can be more involved with the people at the house. Uh, yes, I, I'm much more flexible with that now because I'm not as busy. Gotcha. This might be too close to the question I just asked, but what's something that you've learned about yourself along this journey? Uh, I've learned that. Um, I've learned that uh, that they're finally, finally, ultimately, there's something more important than what I do. Um, you know, I always thought that, uh, however rude or off-putting that I was with someone or with something, uh, once I was able to, you know, put my wares out on the table, everyone would understand. You know. Um, you know, your kids come to a point where they say, where were you, you know, when I was growing up, um, sometimes. And um, I always thought that uh, the work would exonerate me. Uh, it certainly can uh, be a good um, rationalization for oneself, but it doesn't cut it with other people in the world. But if I'm trying to say that, that the bigger thing than what I do, as, as huge as that is, and, and, you know, is who I am. You know, I understand that. Yeah. Very much. And, and I think the reason that you and I may understand, Craig, is that, is that with time comes a little maturity and a little perspective. Yeah. Oh. I, I remember when I, before I worked for myself, it was the last, I guess, job I had. I was working for, I was a financial planner working for a company. And yeah. I was going into work every day and trying to get business and trying to get leads. And I would make literally sometimes 400 calls a day and nothing would happen. Oh, and, yeah. and I, I think right. I was, I was working with a therapist at the time 
for other issues to deal with. Yes. And she said, you know, don't forget yes. who you are is not what you do. And I put that in well, my that's, office. That's a woman's perspective. That's yeah. A woman's perspective. Right. And but, I put, I but put, to us, <laughs> it is. Right. Very much. And, and, and more so in what you do. Because, again, even though I'm giving 110%, I'm emotionally vested, I don't have the vulnerability that a musician has when they create something. Yeah. I, I think okay. there's a tremendous vulnerability in there. And, and that's why and I didn't realize this, but that has been one of the really nice benefits for me of starting this thing and talking with all you guys because – uh, creatives, musicians in particular, I can't say others because I haven't talked to others, but are, are very comfortable making sure. themselves vulnerable in a conversation like you've just, just did, you know, and I, I need to do a better job of that. Or, and, and I'm doing a better job, but, but in, in dealing with everybody who does it all day, it becomes like kind of easier yeah. for me. It's like, Oh, this it's is, not. this is safe. It's not the end of the world, you know? Uh, so I, yeah. I totally, well, that's part of what your therapy talk about things you know yeah 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 and this was uh 19 early 90s you know but um but, but you know it's a it's a funny it's an old cliche when a man meets another man uh you know after hi who you know what your name is what do you do correct women never ask them women ask who are you who are you who are you married to who are you related to they're they're asking who are you? Where are you located in your family? You know, they ask those men, what do you do? Right. So, even though it's politically incorrect these days to differentiate between the sexes, uh, I think there's great difference between them, and that's one of the main things. And I, I, I laugh that I've discovered that uh, somewhere along the line that, that, that one of the differences is that men ask what you do, and women ask who are you. Yeah, very, very much. This is a very accurate statement, actually. Yeah, and I think that the women are right. You know. Well, it's yeah, it, right, right. It, it, do you have any heroes, or have you ever had any heroes? Well, tons of heroes. You just uh, have to, you have to narrow it down. I mean, uh, you might pick pick the uh, area. You talk about musical heroes, yeah, okay. political heroes, no, uh, somebody financial heroes, but somebody who inspired you to move forward. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, generally, they've aligned with the bands I've been, uh, I've been in. For example, I idolize a guy uh, who, who uh, uh, an older guy in high school, who let me be a member of the band, even though I was a freshman and they were all uh, seniors or juniors or seniors, you know. Um, and this guy who was the leader of the band in my high school band, uh, I idolized him. And uh, it's a tremendous motivation uh, for me to step up and, and, and pull my game out. You know, uh, um, uh, then when I got into, um, you know, other bands, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, the guys that I've had work with have, have usually been idols. I idolize Michael Martin Murphy. I mean, he was a guy who has written hits over four to five decades. Uh, Leon Russell. Uh, I've worked with heroes. When I joined New Bedford Revival, Sam Bush was, was my hero. Uh, I aspired to what he had, uh, that spiritual, musical connection that he brought to his playing. Um, so, yes, of course, I now uh, I, I have my Desert Island uh, records and I've got my Desert Island players. I always thought that David Lindley was the, was the best guitar player. Ever, and uh, I still feel that way. Although you know, to say who's your favorite guitar player, that's a silly question because I can only give you the answer of who I think of at the moment. Yes. Um, but as far as David Lindley goes, and I understand that he does play guitar and other instruments, but his main axe was his lap steel. Be that as it may, the melodic ideas that he brings to the songwriter, whether it's Crosby and Stills and Nash, or whether it's Jackson Brown or Linda Ronstadt, or whoever he's playing with, are, are stunning, astounding. Um, he carries on a conversation with the singer, with the melody, with the nature of the song. He gets to the heart 
of this nature of the song. I just, uh, I've always idolized. Uh, I don't want, I mean, that's not a good word. I've always admired yeah. and he has inspired me. Uh, so I bring that up. That's easy to come up. Uh, but there's been many people. You know, of course, of course, I fell in love with the Beatles, as you and everyone did. I fell in love with Bob Dylan and the way he was able to move music out of the moon spoon love schmub um, variety. You know, uh, when a guy can write a song that says the sun's not yellow, it's chicken. You know, I mean, you know, uh, you know, he, he completely, you know, revolutionized music. Um, he's our, you know, he's a Beethoven. He's a, uh, I don't know. We know he's a, um, uh, he's a, uh, Hoagie Carmichael. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, uh, 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 a Cohen. Uh, he's a, what's the guy? Uh, hundred years old. Our, our, our American songwriter, Irving Berlin. Uh-huh. He's our Irving Berlin. You know, in my study of popular music, you know, I could tell you, uh, why, uh, Irving Berlin, uh, uh, swept this country, uh, every bit like Beatlemania when he fashioned what they call ragtime together. It, it moved across the country like a, like a tidal wave, just like the Beatles did. But so I have a lot of people to admire, but it's only because I've made an, a, a an active point to study what came and what. And so, um, you know, you know, you know, Einstein famously said, I see far because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, you know, the few times that I've sat down to teach somebody, I recognize that there are some players that want to learn a lick, you know, show me how Eddie Van Halen plays this. Show me how Tony Rice plays this. Show me how, uh, George Harrison or who Gary Clapton. And I've always thought, I'm not teaching you anything unless you understand where that lick came from. See? And so, and uh, sometimes I've really irritated some people by trying to push that. But to me, um, what's the old, I'm full of cliches, what's the old adage? Uh, give a guy a fish, right? And you feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, then you've done something infinitely great. Feed, feed so, him for a lifetime. Yeah. And, and so my attitude about music has always been, I want to know where it came from. Yes, I've been knocked out by players, but my first thought is, where did he get that? And so then you discover the many streams of American music, you know, that have gone on, on and have run into each other and parted. And, and, uh, and, and so that's going to joy. Uh, and uh, my admiration uh, is for many, many people because um, you know, one of the joys, maybe the joy, Craig, of uh, what I've done uh, is, uh, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with numbers or who's number 15 or who's number 30. Or, here's my joy is um, I have been a part of the story. See? Now, somebody can say, well, he's been a tiny part of the story. And somebody else can say about me, oh, he's been a good part of the story. I, I, it doesn't matter you know that that's not I, i'm not responsible for that i know that i've been part of the book i've been yeah. part of the story it's a long story and it goes way back and, and there's been many many styles and genres and peers people involved in it you know what i mean i'm talking about the story of music yeah and so to have been a guy who has been able to be on a page or two uh you see that's my joy i have been able to become part of the story. That's all I ever wanted. The, the story of music, this thing that's so compelling and important to you, the, the agape yeah, that you have. Because for absolutely. I mean, you know, I could have loved music but never been able to really contribute to it, you know. Yeah. But I have been able to contribute a couple of things. You know, I might be on a few pages, you know. I'm back there in the, uh, I'm in the back of the thing, uh, you know, uh, the bibliography, city. So uh, <laughs> I, I, that's my, that's my joy. That's what I take pride in, you know. Uh, uh, but um, I wish I could have done more. But uh, that is my joy. Pat, and I'm not ready to lay it down. You know, I've still got I've got a project right now. I'm excited about. Uh, but it's just about staying interested. You know. What's the most important thing your dad and your mom taught you, each separately? Uh, my parents are both passed away, so I don't want to, I don't want to throw any shade on them. I think they provided 
more of a lesson by contrast. In other words, I think my upbringing in a very, very middle class mainstream, you know, if you know, if you don't hear about it on television, you know, it's not valid. Uh, you know, uh, I get my news from the newspaper and from Walter Cronkite. I like what everybody else likes. I keep my yard the same way everybody else keeps their yard. You see what I'm saying? The American yeah. dream. Convention. Um, yeah. With all due respect to my parents who are extremely hardworking and, you know, to raise nine kids without murdering a couple of them, I think <laughs> is a real thing. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, you know, they say grandchildren are your reward for not killing your kids. <laughs> and I do understand that. Now. Um, but my point is, Craig, and I think the answer to your question for me is I saw the milieu they, that I was born into. And I told my parents honestly, without malice, although that might be a little, you might not accept that, but I think without malice, I told them at one time, I would never have been chosen to be with you guys. You know, you've got <laughs> nothing for me, but you've provi but you provided me a what not to do encyclopedia because everything that you're settling for, I couldn't possibly settle for. I got to go farther. I've got to go deeper. I've got to get out of here. That probably went over well. It didn't go over too well. <laughs> but then again, I, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't use it as a weapon, honestly, Chris. Yeah. I didn't use it as a weapon. Uh, I got along with my parents and uh, to, to their, you know, to the end of their days. And we were on very cordial terms. But I tried to, but I learned as I grew up to be a man that I needed to keep my interaction with my folks on a very surface level. Uh, because that was their thing, see, and I didn't need to impose my thing on them. Now, once I did some things that I did, they were extremely proud. Mm. But I, you know, I could have said to them, "Well, you're proud now, and I'm that's nice." But at the time that I was trying to become prepared to do these things, you just you didn't want to hear about it. You didn't have it. You, you wanted to, to root it out of me. So. You know, but they, they they wouldn't have seen it like that. You see what I mean? Yeah. And I have no Jones to gripe, gripe about my folks. But you asked me a question. I'm trying to answer it honestly. Yeah, man. What I needed to do was I needed to watch them to see how one can become entrapped. Yeah. If, if not, you're not, if you're not, not you know. thinking freely. I wanted to be free. I'm I'm so glad you used the word because that's the word. Did any of your um, brothers or sisters ever get involved with music or pursue it professionally? Yes, my older brother. My mother was killed in an automobile accident when my brother was two and I was one. Holy crap. Um, Sorry, man. She was, she was killed by, well, I never knew her, obviously. Uh, she was killed uh, by uh, two teenagers who were driving around. Uh, they used to call it joyriding back in those days. Mm. Joyriding around uh, and drinking, you know. Um, so my older brother and I, and then my father remarried and had the other eight. So... There, there's a little bit of distance in space there. But my older brother has been very successful. Uh, uh, he started out just like I did musically, but he ended up being a stand-up comedian. And, um, you know, he's made tons of money in his life. Uh, he hasn't been well-known. He's not Woody Allen. But but uh, uh, the comedy boom of the 80s, as you would call it, well, all of a sudden every town had a comedy club. And uh, he uh, he was, you know, he's just the top guy everywhere he went. He worked and, and, and he's a funny guy. And so he uses his guitar a little bit in his act. That's cool. Uh, is, is he in L.A.? Or is, is he in the West Coast still? Yeah. That's nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He works up and down the West Coast. And he, he, he's got gigs in Vegas. He does casinos. And Pat, do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music? Because, I mean, you're a super yes. bright, well-read guy. What, what are those? Well, well, as I told you, um, I did a serious study of pop music using some great textbooks, including e Ian Whitcomb's After the Ball, which is a study of pop music from the beginning. That was one of the great textbooks, but I've read hundreds of books on it. So I did a real in-depth study. That was a joy. That was an avocation, or hobby, as you call it. Um, I got a degree in school. You know, that, that's a, you can call that a hobby. Sure. Uh, I got, uh, I've done five years of, of uh, five years of, um, research on the Kennedy assassination uh, and I intend to get a degree with that a PhD in that it'll be a history degree or a sociology I don't know what I'll, I don't know how I'll slide but I'm at the beginnings of that so yes I've had 
things that I got interested in, and I pursued them as I've had the time, you know. Man, you're very intellectually, like, and academically oriented in your pursuit of knowledge. Very consistent with. with well, I'm com- I'm comfortable in, in school. You know, I'm comfortable in academia. I did uh, some postgraduate work at Vanderbilt. I'm comfortable in the classroom. Yeah, I can speak that language. Hmm. You know, there's a there's a lingo there, just like we have a lingo for musicians. You know, uh, and I don't. Uh, I enjoy uh, stretching the muscles that are not involved with music sometimes. But I always think it. You know, I think it's connected. Don't ask me how, but I think the total is connected. I'm not sure how, but I feel more enervated as a musician, uh, even though I'm digging one of my ho- hobbies, you know? So anyway. I, yeah, usually it's left brain, right brain. It's not necessarily, not all the time, but it's not generally that, that what you'll find. So it's interesting. Uh, three, I'm going to ask you three more questions, Pat. First one is, is there anything that you're cur- sure. currently trying to improve on, like deliberately, like musically or personally, business, self-development, anything else? Yes. Um, you know, I did a series of CDs and I, and I used a connecting device of re, R-E, like when you get a letter that says re, yeah. colon, it means in regards to, right, regarding mm-hmm. something. So you say re, our interview. Um, so I've done three records so far, solo records, and the first one was uh, request, the next one was, was revision, and the latest one is, is renew. Um, I'm going to do a best of those three uh, to try to put something out this summer, and it's going to be called uh, um, Review, uh, because I'll pull some things off each record. Called now, re- Review? The, what, yeah, okay. but it's always with a small R-E yeah. colon. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Request, revision, uh, renew, and then this will, the best of will be called Review. Mm. Um, anyway, I've, I've done well with the records, you know. They, you know, people who especially know me from New Grants were glad to have them. And why did you wait so long? Well, the first thing is I had a back pocket full of songs, you know, you know, three feet high. Because when the band broke up, I didn't stop enjoying writing. Mm. But these are, you see what I mean? So I had so much material in the pipeline as I was busy doing sessions. You know, I wanted to get it out. But these three records would be, and I put them in a trilogy. As I wanted to make the point is that this is what I would have brought to Newgrass to be a kept going, see? Uh, this is what I would have contributed. This is an extension of my singing, writing, playing, blah, blah, blah. And, and it's still in, in the basic genre, although they're more drum-oriented or whatever sometimes. Uh, but, the, but also, Craig, to be super honest, I was three times as busy doing sessions and, and productions and special events than I was in Newgrass, but as you can imagine, Bayless, uh, you, you, know, you know, Sam and John stayed on the bluegrass circuit, and Bayla stayed on the, you know, we went on the jazz circuit. They were all very visible to people, yeah. and I was very invisible, as you can, as you can, you know, you can picture this. Yeah. And people would constantly ask me as I would run into fans and people who knew me from bluegrass, "What are you doing? What happened to you?" Oh, and, uh, but you were I, just I, as I, busy as ever. Appreciate that much busier, making more money, and uh, basically accessing much more, many more people. However, the roles I was playing were background, you know, and so people don't know the session players, they don't know the producers, they don't know the writers, they really don't, they don't care. The fact is, I, all the guys, three guys, all of a sudden, Bayla, John, and Sam were at Telluride, or they're at Winfield, or they're at, uh, uh, or the Merle Fest. Well, where's Pat? He disappeared. And Mark O'Connor said, man, I heard you became a doctor. I mean, there's all <laughs> sorts of weird Holy things. Holy shit. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying that kind of wore on me, but I couldn't do anything about it. Uh, so when I had the chance, as I said, when the dual, when the s- twin tsunamis hit us, I decided to set up my company. The first thing I did was spend about five and a half years doing these three records. You know, I mean, all, all told, you know, putting them out over five and a half years. Yeah. And so these three records, I'm very proud of and so uh, if you say what currently are you doing I'm representing these records for number one and you say what are you trying to get better at I'm trying to be a better artist Craig I, I'm not trying to be a solo artist per se because if you buy one of my records yes they're my songs or my arrangements of a cover uh, and yes there's tons of, of friends Nashville hotshots on them 
Uh, but um, I'm carrying on, to me, the tradition of Newgrass Revival. I'm not accepting that we broke up. This is my protest, if you'll, <laughs> if you'll understand. Occupy Newgrass Revival. This is Revival. my protest. Uh, hey, I'm, I should, you should call it perfect. Re- it's, yeah. That's a perfect. Yeah. I wish I could use that. I'm going to use Occupy. What a great way to put it. There you go. You should call I'm it. I'm still the guy with the rebel flag, uh, uh, Craig. I, I believed in Newgrass Revival, and I never put it that way. That way, I say to people, I believe in your church of God. And the way they take it is, oh, you believe in the spirit of what you of what you did. Well, yeah, but I also believe that if it wasn't for people who can't get over themselves, some people, some people who can't get over themselves and who can't come to terms with the fact that their thing has never superseded the grass, uh, they've decided to stick their feet in the ground and we're never going to do Reunion, except if Garth Brooks calls and we do records with him, which we did, uh, then they'll do that because they think it's good for them. So I'm just over here on the side. I'm not arguing or doing interviews about Newgrass. I'm just making records and saying, hey, this is what I contributed. This is what I brought to the table. And this is what I still believe in. Sure. So make no mistake that there's an agenda behind my records. And the main agenda isn't, oh, Pat Flynn's going to be a solo, solo artist. Well, sure. Sure, you are so solo artist if you put a record out, but what I'm doing is keeping Newgrass alive as best I can. Gotcha. Better, I want to be a better singer. I want to be a better player, Craig. I want to be a better writer. And so what I'm pushing myself on is what I've always pushed myself on, solo expression. You know, And so I'm still living the dream. That's all I can say. And not in a, not in a, and I got to be careful, you know, I'm not stuck somewhere in time. I'm not, uh, I'm not back there saying, you know, it's just, you know, and I can make examples. I could tell you that, you know, Henley tried to outdo the Eagles and Glenn and Paul tried to outdo the Beatles. But then again, if I say that, then some people say, oh, you mean you're comparing yourself to the Beatles? No, I'm not. I'm just, I'm just trying to find an example where you say, yeah. um, Newgrass was more than the sum of their parts. You know, it wasn't just four guys. It was what happened when these four guys got together. And I grew up as a player, singer, writer, arranger, whatever. We produced our own records mostly. And so I grew up in that band, uh, in my love affair with those guys and their love affair with me. Uh, we created uh, terrific music that I love as much as anybody does. Mm. But I'm going to carry on, you know, I'm going to carry on. And just because Paul McCartney does um, Beatle covers, there's plenty of other Paul McCartney stuff in that show. And he wants to let you know that he is current as today, but he doesn't pretend that he's not still a Beatle. That's what I want to say without trying to make myself like uh, Paul McCartney, of course. I totally get it, man. I hope you do. It's hard to express. And I stumbled over it. In too many interviews. <laughs> no, no, it's just pretty straightforward, man. You're trying to, you know, okay. continue the tradition and do what you do and enjoy it. That's pretty. You know. Yes, and the and the first thing I'll do when we get up, we get up is I I'll get you a dress. I want you to have those records. I really want. Now that I've met you, I really want you to hear them and and and, and Thanks, uh, man. you can enjoy them or not. But I want you to have them. Thanks. That's kind of you. Yeah. We got Next question. Right what, what's, I'll send them out tomorrow. What's the toughest? This is a tough question, man. Toughest decision you've yeah. ever had to make, or the hardest thing you've ever had to do. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just sort of just answer this casually as things come to my mind. And if we hit on anything awkward, then that's just the way it is. I think um, getting older has been terribly difficult because uh, inside my head, I'm better at everything I do than what. When I was 35, I'm totally better. It's just a, that's the easiest, most obvious thing in the world. I, I'm a better player, smarter writer, better singer, better get along with in the studio as far as producing. I know how to produce. I'm better at everything, but because of my age, I'm immediately discounted by young people. Uh, they see me and they, you know, and they say, hello, sir. You know, I'm, I'm not a relevant part of their world. And that's difficult on me. Because I want to scream at some people, hey, I do I do what I do better. You ought to check it out. It would help you. But I can't say that. 
because mm. uh, uh, it'll become creepy. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you have to accept. You're supposed to accept. We're supposed to accept that we're older, and that we're going to be put in our little slots. You know, go ahead and sit in your rocking chair and, and out in front of the old folks' home, and you know, enjoy your little pipe dreams, and uh, and we'll take we'll take it from here. And that's the way of the world. That's been very difficult for me as I continue to improve. You know, in the things that I do, there's less and less people, uh, not of my age, but of the younger age, uh, who are all about the music business as, as the young people. Right? That's always been true. And so it's harder and harder to find something relevant. Uh, you know, uh, Bluegrass is not like that. I just produced a number one Bluegrass CD, so I'm real proud of that. That happened uh, in December. And uh, But you see, those are not young people. Those are just people who already know me. Um... But uh, that's that's difficult. That's one thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know any other way around that. There's very few people. When I have a young person, and it doesn't have to be a young lady; it can be a young guy. When a young person smiles at me, I, I want to stop and thank him. But of course, I can't because again, it'd be creepy. But I want to <laughs> say thanks. Thanks for the smile. You know what I'm saying? Instead of yeah. instead of checking me out as an old man walking by, I just I, I mean it at a real elemental level. It's difficult. I don't know about you. Yeah. But it's difficult to be dis- discounted before. You- you get a chance to play. Uh, that's one thing. I think another thing that was very important uh, is that uh, there's. I've always had a terrible conflict dichotomy uh, between being very solitary and needing people around me. Um, it, it's the strangest thing. I'm most comfortable and most often stay by myself, very happy to be doing my little thing and working on my little projects and bringing my little pans to boil but if there's people buzzing around my house right i'm glad i mean i don't have to interact with them but they're here you see if the house was empty and silent it would bother me that's a weird thing that is it's a weird not that thing. i want to be to be in their traffic all the time or, or or in the middle of what they're doing i just want to know they're here and that they're happy and fine and they're all buzzing around doing their thing then I can be by myself and be happy. If they're gone and there's no one around, then it's really difficult on me. feels so lonely. I don't have any idea what that, yeah, I don't know what that's about. It's Interesting. a really weird thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's not unprecedented. I've read this about people, uh, and I so there, there, there's something that that thing is, hmm. okay, but I don't, I don't know how to name it. It's, it's very unusual. Uh, I don't like to go out. And to clubs, uh, and it's not because I'm not interested in hearing the music. If I could go out in a bubble, <laughs> I would. But then, if I go to a club, I've got to talk to people. Some people will know me, and they'll want to talk, and that's great, and I love that. But it bothers me. I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> I love to see them. I like. I like them. I, I, I like them. That but, you know what? It, 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 that's really what? interesting because. So okay, let's say I'm in Nashville and I bump into you. I, you yeah. And and yes. your knee jerk reaction, and I don't. I'm not going to take this personal at all. Uh, your knee jerk reaction would be, "Oh, that's nice. I'm just, you know, nice to see you goodbye." Because you're more comfortable being alone. Well, well, let me put it this way. Your example I'm is a, not real good. I'll tell you why. I'm a what? Because if I'm out. Yeah. I said your example is, is not a good one. I'll tell okay. you why. Yeah, tell me. Uh, it's it's different. Well, you see. Uh, once I get out there, Craig, it's, it's always easier once I get out there. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, so if I'm already out on the street or in a club and run into you, then everything's good. It's fine. I guess It's you. just a matter of kind of making a decision to get ready and to go into a social situation where there's a lot of people to talk to. That's something that is very difficult. That's why I said I it would be different uh, than you asked me if I ran into you. Yeah. If I was already out there it becomes a lot easier. And I always think, what do I worry about? You know, I got gotcha. you. You made the decision. That totally makes sense. Mike. I got yeah. it, man. Yeah. Um, last question. What, what's been the biggest change in your personality, Pat, over the last 10 years? Yes, that's a good question. Um, of course, there's been a lot of little changes and the big changes in the last 10 years. Hmm. Uh, it seems like the biggest change is I've got more patience. I think that is something that's uh, been different. I always felt like I was running twice as fast 
you know, all the time because I feel like I had to, I feel like I was fall, running behind, you know, running on empty or something. Um, I don't feel that way. I've got more patience to deal with things as they unroll, as they unfold, uh, and not have any expectations about how something should go. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that, I think that comes from a young man's desire to control, you know, events and, uh, and have things turn out well, rather than somebody just uh, feels like, uh, you know, that's an illusion. You know, you'd be better off and better blood pressure to accept things that come apart, come along and just deal with them as they come uh, and not have any big expectations. You know, um, somebody said to me years ago, and I really didn't understand it at the time, uh, is that the 11th commandment is... Um, you know, thou shalt not have uh, high expectations. <laughs> uh, and it seemed dis- it seems it seemed uh, dis- not disingenuous, but it seemed um, counterintuitive to me. Of course, you need to have high expectations, right? But I think what that what the joke was or the saying was meaning, don't try to control everything. You yeah. know, your expectations of how things should go or doggone it. Um, uh, it didn't. It didn't turn out the way it's supposed to, because you and I both know, in retrospect, that a lot of the things in our lives that went wrong or came out in the way that we shouldn't ended up being a plus. Yeah, very uh, much so. You know what I mean? Yeah, very um, much so. What was that song that Pat Alger wrote for Garth? Um, Thank God for unanswered prayers. It, it's a <laughs> lot of times, and I, and I get the point. And it's a good. It's a good song title. Uh, Thank goodness that we're not stuck with the expectations we had of how things should go. Uh, because uh, uh, more often than not, uh, life is what happens while you're busy making other plans, right? Yeah. I well, can think of all the cliches. Well, what is that other one? You know, man plans, you know, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans or something like that. Right. Man proposes and God disposes. Yeah, something like uh, that. There's a million of them. You know, there's uh, 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 I was thinking of something uh, recently. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. I was thinking about how on any given normal day, you and I, we've got things to do, so we get about it. And then let's say you run out of gas. Let's say you have a flat tire. Let's say there's a traffic that that, that, that snarls in front of you and you know you're going to be late and you just can't be late. Any normal person would just, you know, you know, get uh, a little bit pissed off. I mean, that's just normal. But on the other hand, years and years of that uh, is really a drag, uh, as opposed to getting up and as soon as your eyes are open, you know, become thankful that you are awake and alive one more day and then say, well, here's what I want to accomplish today, but I'm going to expect hurdles. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and expect the unexpected. I'm going to go ahead and roll with whatever might come to you know, waste my time or whatever. I'll be ready for that so that when it happens, I'll kind of just shrug my shoulders. I think I can, uh, I totally am much more in that particular space than I ever was 10, 20 years ago. That's the thing. That's the only thing I can think of really, Craig, as far as change. Yeah. I, 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 you know what helped me get rid of my expectations was raising children. Well, I I did the same thing. So I'm sure that that's the same for me. I'm sure that you're right. I think kids kind of just beat patience into you. (laughs) Nothing else. Patience I've had, but expectations is, is, for me anyway, it was a little different. Like in in raising my kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're right, man. I get you. You know, we have expectations. Uh, I've been the guy in the... uh, Oh, I got to tell you a funny story because you just you just uh, said something about expectations. Well, oh, this is telling on myself, but I think it's kind of funny, a uh, very funny. Uh, you know the Warren Brothers. You know who they are? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm, I spoke. I'm getting on ready to get on a call, with Brad, in a couple of weeks. Well, yeah. please say hi for me because I will. He's uh, a really cool been, guy, man. Really. Nice oh, he's a great guy. guy. Great guy. Um, Good story. Oh, I've got a great story about them, but it's embarrassing. So uh, I'm going to tell you to ask him about the Superman story. All right. I'm just making a note now. Just say, I'm not going to tell it. It's not my story to tell, but it's a legendary Music Row story. Legendary. And he he knows exactly what I mean. 
ask him about the Superman story and see if I he'll will. tell it. I just wrote it's, it down. it's hysterical. And tell him that Pat told you. I will. Now, we've been friends, but we were really close for a period of time because our sons were both in Little League at the same time on the same okay. team. So rather than seeing the guys occasionally, normally, uh, we were sitting on the stands um, every Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and... Um, Sage was the name of his son, and my son Pearson and Sage were on the same team. All right, so we're talking and doing this and that, and both of us hate that parent. You know the one who's constantly shouting out, "Hurry up!" You know, or why did you catch? You know, like they're living vicarious. Like every move oh, that their kid horrible. makes is l life and death for the. Yeah, yeah, I know. Horrible, and they're you know, and we see those parents every game. There's oh, some yeah. stupid parent who doesn't understand that he's traumatizing the boy uh, and embarrassing the boy. It's just ridiculous. So we would laugh about that. So one day I became the parent and here's how it happened. And he's resolved. He, he, he's involved. He caused me to be thrown out of a baseball game. <laughs> uh, you can ask me about this. It's a super funny story. Uh, not at the time. Uh, so we're talking and we're going to say, now these umpires that do little league are not major league umpires. They're guys that are either in it for the love of it or they could use the 75 and 50 bucks a game sure. or whatever. And most of them are wonderful people. This umpire behind the plate happened to be a real asshole. Uh, and um, it got worse. I mean, he was just a guy, whenever the manager would ask about a call, he would try to shame him saying, get back in the dugout. You know, I'll, I'll call them. You know, I'm the umpire. You know, you do your job. I'll do my. I mean, he was just a jerk. And he wasn't that knowledgeable. His strike zone calls were, 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 were pathetic. And uh, uh, he was getting no affection from the crowd because it's one thing to be a bully. But uh, if you're not competent and you're a bully, you know, you're. So we were not happy with him. And, um, and uh, uh, I had yelled out. Uh, and I did this because he and I were egging each other on about this up. And so. I had a funny line I came up with uh, my son Pearson, and I've taught him since he was little. Don't strike, don't, you know, don't swing at bad pitches, right? Mm. It's part of the of being a great baseball player. And I knew I taught him, and but this guy's strike zone was all over the place, see? And so I saw Pearson get called out, third strike call on my son with a ball that was at, almost hit him in the shoelaces. Right. So it clearly shouldn't uh, have been a strike. Oh my God. And I was mad on behalf of my son because he looked at the ball because I taught him don't swing at bad pitches. Sure. And he was, and he was shocked and he was just going standing at the plate like that. And, uh, uh, as soon as the umpire said, and of course he, there had already been bad calls. So, so we're sitting there, uh, and, uh, Warren and I are sitting there and the, I'm like, a strike three. You know, he says everything with, you know, authority. Yeah. And I, and, and it was real quiet because the crowd kind of went, <gasps> Because it was such a ridiculous pitch. And I said, oh, you mean like a strike in bowling? <laughs> All right. Now, the guy, the umpire, whips around and points at me and says, one more word out of you, buddy, and you're out of here. You know? Oh, my. Yeah, so, as if he so could I, throw you out of a Little League game. No, no, he can. Oh, he can. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yes. Listen, okay. if you get thrown out of a game, you not only have to get up. You can't just move away. You have to leave the park. If you don't, then the game w will be called for the other team. The game will be will, will be wow. you will lose that game. I didn't realize. Uh, so no, no. no so these days, I don't know how it was in the old days, but these days the umpires have had that authority. All right. So he goes, one more word out of you. So, 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 so Warren's laughing at me, you know, and he was saying he's been talking trash too, but but I said that out loud and I did it on purpose, right? And the crowd laughed and this and this and that, but my son did not appreciate it, right? So I'm sitting here, and so I said, fine. So I, I was just cooling out. The next pitch, Craig, uh, on the next batter or whatever, it wasn't his son, it was just some kid, and it was a terrible pitch. He called a strike, and, and he says, he, he gets real close to me, and he goes, what? Well, the umpire turns around and throws me out. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was, it, it, it was Warren. And uh... he's not going to own this. He is cracking up. He's, 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 he's got his head down, you know, where he can't be seen. And he's just laughing his ass off. And I said, are you going to tell him? And uh, uh, I think he finally tried to get the umpire's attention and said it was me, but the umpire wasn't having it. And so, so he, he threw you out. Absolutely. And like I said, I had to leave the park 
get a drive away before they resumed the game. And wow. My son, and your poor my son, son was so must have been furious at me. Orange. But, but I, I got out of it. Now, my son was just, as, as you can imagine, a kid who's like, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 would be uh, at a game uh, because that's just like I became that parent, right? And uh, it's funny, but Warren could, he just thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And the reason that my son let me off the hook, because I expected him to come home and just lay into me, and I, I would have taken it. I mean, I deserved it. But he comes home and goes, man, that really sucked what you did. I said, no. He goes, but everybody on my team thought it was hysterical. They oh, thought it was a funny okay. lot. So because his, because his peeps thought it was cool, yeah. he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't mad at me anymore. So I, I sneak out of it. But to this day, Warren will say, will say, hey, man, you got to keep your composure with these games. You know? So, so I want you to remind him of that. I will. Talk to him. I yeah. will. I'll talk to him. And don't forget about the Superman. Superman star. I wrote it down. I wrote it down, man. Yeah, those guys are good guys, man. Well, hey, uh, you have been awesome here. I want to tell people how to find you and, and yeah. where you're at and how they can get to know you musically. Well, so, it's super, super simple. You can, yep. go on, you can go on YouTube. You can go on uh, patflynnmusic.com. Uh, you know, it's real easy. On, my records are in all the places that you get music. It doesn't matter what it is, Pandora and uh, Spotify. You know, all the other. Spotify, uh, CD Baby, you can buy Buy, you can buy it from Amazon or you can buy it from there's good reviews posted. Uh, uh, w what would be great is you, you go ahead and put it up on your thing and put a good word out on it. And just don't forget to remind them I've got some records out. I want them to I want them to uh, check out. And those would be my three solos request, revision and renew and occupy. We got to figure and out how occupy, to get the, the net one, how to get that one. Reoccupy. <laughs> well, I'm going to figure out a way to use it. It's a perfect word. Reoccupy. You know, yeah. NGR. Occupado, maybe. I yeah. don't know. I'll use it. Yeah. Uh, listen, right, man, thank you for everything. I appreciate it. Also, tell tell people to go to uh, Pat Flynn on uh, Pat Flynn Insta on Instagram. That's it. And uh, uh, yeah. And Facebook is Pat Flynn Facebook. That's easy to find. Um, now, don't forget to send me your contact, Craig, so I can send you the music. I will. Let me just sign off and say goodbye to everybody, and you and I can wrap up. Everybody, okay. thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks again to Pat Flynn for sharing all his time with us and telling us all his stories. I really appreciate it. And go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes along with some cool stuff for guitar players. We'll be rolling out soon. And be nice. Go play your guitar. And most important, have some fun. Till next time, peace and love. And I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.